Day 1. Test yourself. You are going to hear some facts and figures about Australia. First, you have some time to read questions 1 through 10. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 through 10. Welcome to this talk about Australia. I'm going to give you some key facts and figures about the country, which I hope you'll find of interest. First, let's start with geography. Where is Australia? Australia is in Oceania, between the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific Ocean. Australia is ranked as a continent. It's the smallest continent, having an area of 7.6 million square kilometers. Of that, 68,920 square kilometers is water, so in land area, Australia is slightly smaller than the U.S. In fact, Australia is the world's sixth largest country. As a very large island, Australia's climate is generally dry, that is, arid to semi arid, temperate in the south and east, tropical in the north. The terrain, that's the type of land surface, is mostly low plateau with deserts and fertile plain in the southeast. The lowest point in Australia is Lake Eyer at negative 15 meters. The highest point is Mount Kosciusko, that's spelt K O S C I U S K O, at 2,229 meters. Australia is rich in natural resources. Among the chief are bauxite, coal, iron ore, copper, tin, silver, and nickel. You may have heard of the Australian gold rush, and some gold is still exported. We have several environmental issues here in Australia. The top one is soil erosion. The main reasons for soil erosion are firstly, overgrazing, secondly, industrial development. And thirdly, urbanization, the growth of cities. Another issue is the rising amount of salt in our soils. This comes from using poor quality water. Desertification, the growth of the desert, is another problem. In addition, clearing land for agricultural purposes threatens the natural habitat of many unique animal and plant species. Then, also, the Great Barrier Reef off the northeast coast, which is the largest coral reef in the world, is threatened by increased shipping and by its popularity as a tourist site. The second section of this talk is about Australia's population. We Australians are concentrated along the eastern and southeastern coasts. So, how many Australians are there? Well, as of July 1997, there were an estimated 18.4 million. Of these, 66% were aged between 15 and 64 years. Life expectancy at birth is 79 years, 76 years for men and 82 for women. Now, I should tell you that the country of Australia is made up of six states and two territories. These are The Australian Capital Territory, New South Wales, the Northern Territory, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and Western Australia. The national capital is Canberra. Right, let's turn to the Australian economy. Australia has a prosperous Western style capitalist economy. Australia is a major exporter of agricultural products, minerals, metals, and fossil fuels. Commodity prices have a big impact on the economy. Australia suffered from the low growth and high unemployment typical of the OECD countries in the early 1990s, but the economy has expanded at reasonably steady rates in recent years. In addition to high unemployment, short term economic problems include how to balance output and inflation and how to stimulate exports. The economy is made up like this agriculture, 3.1%, industry, 27.7%, services, 69.2%. 
the labor force has a similar pattern. The total labor force is 8.2 million. 34% work in finance and services, 23% work in public and community services, 20% work in the wholesale and retail trade, 17% work in manufacturing and industry, and 6% work in agriculture. What are the chief industries of Australia? They are mining, industrial, and transport equipment, food processing, chemicals, and steel. What are Australia's main agricultural products? They are wheat, barley, sugarcane, fruit, cattle, sheep, and poultry. And who do we sell our products to? At present, our chief export market is Japan, which takes 24% of our exports. After that, South Korea takes 8%, and New Zealand and the U.S. each take 7%. In years to come, however, we expect China to become a significant trade partner. China already supplies 5% of Australia's imports. This is the same amount as New Zealand. Meanwhile, we take one-fifth, in fact 22% of our imports from the U.S., 17% from Japan, and 6% from the U.K. So what sort of things does Australia import? Well, we import a lot of machinery and transport equipment, especially computers and office machines, also telecommunications equipment, and, in addition, we have to import oil and petroleum products. So, let's move to the subject of communications in Australia. We have an estimated 8.7 million telephones and 9.2 million televisions. There are some 134 television broadcast stations and 325 radio stations. The related subject of transport is naturally very important in such a big country as Australia. Let's look at highways first. There are two kinds of highways, paved and unpaved. Paved highways are regular roads with a permanent surface. But actually, we have more unpaved highways around 60% than paved, when all the country roads are included. In addition, Australia has a railway network of over 38,000 kilometers. But you'll probably find it hard to believe how many airports we've got. 10? 20? 50? No, the total is 443. Of course, this includes many short runways on farm and in the outback. There are only nine airports with runways of more than 3,000 meters. Day 2. Test yourself. Look at this advertisement for a job. Listen to Philip and Anne talking about the job and fill in the missing words. Look at the questions now. Now we shall begin. Look, here's one that might interest you. What is it? Are you sure? The last one you sent me off to was a disaster. Yes, look. It says they want a junior sales manager, and it looks like it's a big international company. That'd be good. You might get to travel. What kind of company is it, though? Let's see. Yes, it's a textile company that seems to import from abroad. That's odd, isn't it? What else? They say the salary is really good. They operate a system of paying you a basic salary and then offering sales commission on top of that. They say it's high. And, oh, look, they give you a car to travel around in. Gosh, that's not bad, is it? Uh, uh, do they say anything about experience? Mm, let's see. No. They want someone young with ambition and enthusiasm. Oh, yes, they want graduates, so that's okay. You've been to university. Now, what else? Let's see. There must be some catch. No, the only thing is you have to travel. But then 
That's what the company cars for. Oh, and you have to be able to get on well with other people, because it says you have to be good in a team. Um, perhaps I'll have a closer look at that one. Day three. Test yourself. One. Listen to the interview with a psychologist who studies dreams. Then choose the best answer. Look at the questions now. Now we shall begin. Now, could you tell us more about what you do in your department? I mean, what research are you actually doing at the moment? We're trying to find out as much as we can about dreams. There's one area that we're particularly interested in at the moment, and that is what we call directed dreaming. Directed dreaming. What is that exactly? Let me explain. You know, sometimes if you're having a dream and you wake up in the middle of it, you can sometimes go back to sleep again and go back to the dream. Yes. Well, that is similar to what we call directed dreaming. Now, what I was talking about is a fairly common experience, but real directed dreamers are people who have always complete control over what they dream because they actually know what they're dreaming.、Uh, they can dream what they want. Yes, nearly. Can anyone develop this ability? Well, that's one of the things that we would like to find out. At our centre, we have in fact got three people who are very reliable and who can have these directed dreams quite regularly. And what sort of experiments do you do with them? Well, a few weeks ago, we thought it would be interesting to see if there was any way that the three regular dreamers could communicate with each other in a directed dream while they were sleeping. So one night, we arranged for them all. To stay at the centre. Then we asked the three of them.、Uh, there were two men and a woman. We asked them all to go to a pub that they all knew quite well, down by the river, and asked them if they started dreaming to go down there and try to find each other in the dream or three dreams. Yes. So they all went off to sleep. And the next morning, we interviewed them all separately and asked them what they had seen. The two men had had dreams and could remember them, and they both said that they had been to the pub and had seen each other and had had a talk. But also, both of them said that they hadn't seen the woman, and we thought that was a bit,、mm, a bit odd. And then we talked to her. And she told us that she hadn't had a dream at all that night, or she couldn't remember it anyway. Fascinating. So both of the men said she hadn't appeared in their dreams, and that was because she hadn't in fact been dreaming. Yes, though of course it could just be a coincidence. But that's the kind of thing that we're trying to find out more about. Well, thank you very much, Doctor Border. It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you. Test yourself. Two. Listen to the following talk. Circle the correct answer for questions one to six and complete the table. Good evening and welcome to this month's Observatory Club lecture. I'm Donald Mackey and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago. A total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience, but these days an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse? When the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day, scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. 
it is the shadow of the moon streaking across the earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a different, and to all intents and purposes, a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster, and in fact, the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you are superstitious, or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they are very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second, more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on earth every year or two, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their recurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. It was Edmund Haley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they have since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, then there's Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he had spotted this so-called lost planet. But alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he had been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that rather than being wrong about the number of planets, astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he is so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realized that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on the social. Day 4. Test Yourself 1. Listen carefully to the following talk and choose the correct answer for each question. 
When the Europeans first came to the American continent more than 400 years ago, there were relatively few diseases and viruses on the new continent. During that time, however, plagues and diseases that killed thousands were floating around Europe. Eventually, some Europeans developed immunity to the unsanitary world of industrialization. When they came to the American continent, however, many of the Native Americans had never been exposed to these viruses and hence did not develop immunity to them. By sharing the same food and water sources, many Native Americans contracted the European diseases. At a time when medical vaccines were still in their early stages, this led to the tragic death of thousands. The Native Americans gradually developed immunity to these diseases and were able to interact with the new explorers and colonists. They traded everyday items with each other, which led to the hybridization of these two cultures. One enterprising European colonist had an interesting idea. Why not create a trading post where the two groups could sell their newly combined works of art? Eventually, a post was set up and the distinctly American works became known throughout the country for their unique styles. The trading post continued for a couple more decades until it eventually faded away. The works of that time period can now be seen at the Smithsonian National Museum. Until very recently, some tribes were still making pieces of art and selling them in their local trading posts. Test Yourself too. You are going to hear a talk about making the most of graduate school. As you listen, answer questions 1 to 10. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now, listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 10. Good afternoon. Welcome to you, new entrants to the graduate school. My job now is to give you the graduate school survival guide and make some concise suggestions for getting the most out of your relationship with our research supervisor, getting the most out of what you read, and making continual progress with your research. First, your relationship with your supervisor. This is fundamental. Meet regularly. You should expect to meet once a week or at least every other week because this will give you the motivation to make progress and also keeps your advisor aware of your work. Prepare for your meetings. Come to each meeting. Also, bring the notes from your previous meeting together with a list of any upcoming deadlines. Make a plan for what you hope to get out of each meeting. After the meeting, email your supervisor a brief summary. Include a list of major topics discussed, a list of what you agreed on, a note of any advice you may not want to follow, and a new summary of what you are planning to do. This helps avoid misunderstandings and provides a handy record of the progress of your research. Add a to-do list for yourself and your supervisor, including a reading list. Finally, add the time and date for the next meeting. My second main piece of advice is to keep your supervisor informed. Show him or her the results of your work as soon as possible. This helps your supervisor understand your research and identify any potential points of conflict early in the process. Include summaries of your work, including any results of experiments, and also anything you write about your research. Thirdly, communicate clearly. If you disagree with your advisor, state your objections and concerns clearly and calmly. If you feel that something about your relationship is not working, discuss it with him or her. Whenever possible, suggest steps that they could take to address your concerns. Under this heading, 
it is extremely important to take the initiative. You do not need to clear everything you do in your research with your advisor. He or she is busy too. You must be responsible for your own ideas and the progress of your work. The second section of my talk is about getting the most out of what you read. The first principle here is to be organized. Keep an electronic bibliography with notes and pointers to the paper files. Keep and file all the papers you have read. Point two, be efficient. Only read what you need to. Start by reading only the conclusion, scanning figures and tables, and looking at their references. Read the other sections only if the paper seems relevant or you think it might help you get a different perspective. Skip the sections you think you already understand. These are often the background and motivation sections. It's of critical importance to take good notes on every paper you find worth reading. Note especially what problem the author is trying to solve, what approach they take to the problem, and how their approach differs from other approaches. Next, summarize what you have read on each topic. After you have read several papers on the same topic, note the key problems, the various formulations of the problem under consideration, the relationship between the various approaches and the alternative approaches you come across. Let me add one point you might not have already thought of. Read PhD theses. Even though they are long, they can be very helpful for quickly learning about what has been done in your field of interest. Focus particularly on the background sections and method sections. Don't forget to read your advisor's thesis. This will give you an idea of what he or she expects from you. The third section of my talk is about making continual progress with your research. Keep a journal of your ideas. Write down every issue you are thinking about, even if you think it is stupid. This will help you keep track of your progress and keep you from going round in circles. Set yourself some reasonable goals and deadlines. Identify key tasks that need to be completed. Set a reasonable date for completing them, in terms of weeks or months. Share your goals and deadlines with your advisor. Indeed, enlist his or her help in creating them. Set some deadlines that you cannot avoid keeping. For example, volunteer to give a student seminar on your research or work towards the submission deadline for a conference paper. Once you have set your goals and deadlines, keep a to-do list. Checking off the items on a to-do list can feel very rewarding when you are working on a long-term project. Discuss your research with anyone who will listen. They may have useful insights. At least you will find that putting your ideas into words helps clarify them for yourself. Next point, write about your work. In the early stages, write short idea papers and share them with your advisor and colleagues. Later on, Look for workshops and conferences where you can submit your preliminary results. When your work is nearing completion, target relevant journals. Finally, some points about handling yourself. A key objective is to avoid distractions. It is easy to waste time taking too many classes, teaching classes, organizing student activities, etc. Minimize these commitments and make a list of small tasks which can be done in about an hour. Pick at least one that can be completed each day and make sure you do it. Finally, and this concludes my talk, confront your fears and weaknesses. If you are nervous about speaking in public, volunteer to give talks. If you are afraid your ideas are stupid, discuss them with someone. If you are anxious about writing, write something about your research every day. That's it. Welcome to graduate school. Day 5 
Multiple Choice 1. Listen to the following talk and choose the correct answer for each question. The Atlantic Ocean, named for the legendary lost island of Atlantis, has made up for the romantic origin of its name by becoming the most important commercial highway in the world, yet traces of romance continually mingle with the business of the sea. For instance, the Spanish adventurers who first sought gold and silver in America frequently found their ships becalmed, usually on the edge of the steady trade winds, about 30 degrees north or south latitude. A sailing ship could carry only so much water, and as it lay motionless under a hot sun for days or weeks, the tortures of thirst were agonizing. The horses were generally the first victims. They had to be thrown overboard when they died or became crazed with thirst. Because the Spanish caballeros thought highly of their horses, even crediting them with souls, they suffered great remorse and believed the ghosts of the proud war horses were haunting the scene. They saw the restless spirits in their dreams and related their dreams to sailors. Whenever the mariners passed that way, they would see in the spray or clouds images of wild horses bearing down on them. They began to call the broad belts of calm the horse latitudes, the romantic name by which they are known today. Multiple choice 2. Choose the correct answer, A, B, or C. Joanne! Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin, and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well, where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end, because it's right up at the northern end of Australia, and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney. So you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia. Probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realize until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art, music, dancing, and so on are concerned, because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theater and opera in the same way as cities down in the south, like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves. Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artist groups and writers groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international. Yeah. They say there are over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but mm, when a very bad storm, uh, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious center today, but it's open to tourists, too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see the places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year, it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? 
Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles, too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Multiple Choice 3 You will hear Peter Walsh being interviewed for a job. Listen and choose the correct answer for each question. But first you have some time to read the questions. Now listen and answer the questions. Please sit down, Mr. Walsh. My name's Jane Swain, and I'm the personnel manager. Hello, how do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to chat about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Weston's? It is Weston's, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I am not sure. Let's see. I left university in 2005. Is that right? Yes, 2005. Then I was unemployed for about three months. And then I traveled around America for a few months. So, yes, it must be about three years now, in fact. Hmm, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change jobs? I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting and stimulating. The salary's okay, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted, so that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh, my dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. The other people are great. There's a good cooperative atmosphere. I mean, among the staff, and compared to other companies, the conditions are great. I mean, the office itself and the working conditions. Hmm. And then there's the fact that they give me lots of room for initiative and let me make decisions. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. Yes, well, we're looking for someone like that. You know, someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. And what about your education? You went to Manchester University, didn't you? Uh, yes. After leaving school, I started a diploma course in design, but I decided to give it up and did an arts degree at university instead. Good. And have you done any courses since? Multiple Choice 4 Richard Murray, a zoologist and popular TV personality, has been giving a talk on endangered species of wildlife to members of the Young Conservationists Association in a small town in the south of England. Listen to the extract from the discussion he had with two of the young people after his talk. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, here is the talk. What would you say, Mr. Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't, of course, rule out the effect of urbanization due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which, in a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. 
If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr. Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown, it's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr. Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few, and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. Gorillas, tigers, leopards, and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns, and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies. To decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death, at so much a head on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen. By consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr. Murray, we do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony. But we shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mister Murray, but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunize us from this, that, or the other in the most effective way, at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out. Not to say leaks out. And by that time, it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls. With the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which, though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat, and consequently our own systems, they'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. Day six. Summary one. You will hear a lecture about sports. Listen carefully and fill in all the blanks with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at the questions.
Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 1 to 17. Not all people like to work, but everyone likes to play. As sports help people live happily, they help to keep people healthy and feeling good. When people are playing games, they move a lot. This is good for their health. Having fun with their friends makes them happy. So all over the world, men and women, boys and girls, enjoy sports. Since long ago, adults and children have called their friends together to spend hours, even days, playing games. Sports usually take a variety of forms. Organised competitions, which draw huge crowds to cheer their favourite team to victory. Athletic games, played for recreation anywhere sufficient space is found. And hunting and fishing. Most sports are seasonal, so that what is happening in sports depends on the time of the year. As sports change with the season, people often do not play the same games in winter as in summer. If you want to know what others' favourite sports are, first of all, you should find where they live. Generally speaking, people in hot areas are fond of swimming, while people in cold places love skiing or skating. In this case, surfing is believed to be an important sport in Hawaii. The Pacific Ocean sends huge waves up on the beaches, waves that are just right for surfing. Some sports, including wrestling, boxing, horse racing, etc., are called spectator sports, as the number of spectators greatly exceeds the number of players in the game. Other sports are called participant sports, drawing a crowd of onlookers only on special occasions, such as tournaments. Some sports are commercial and professional, with players who are paid for their participation and with audiences who pay admission to watch. Summary 2 You will hear a radio program in which the speakers discuss the importance of looking after old people in winter. Listen to the dialogue and fill in all the blanks with no more than three words. First, please read the questions. Now listen and answer the questions. Nobody likes cold weather, but for old people it can be particularly uncomfortable and dangerous. They can become cold without even noticing it. To keep warm, they may need help from friends and neighbors like you. To find out how we can help, We've invited a representative from the Social Service Department at the Town Hall to talk about the Winter Warmth Code campaign. Mr. Hastings, can I first ask you why it is so important to keep an eye on elderly people during cold weather such as we've been having lately? Yes. There are two main reasons. First, the old suffer from the cold more than the rest of us. They're not as active or strong as you and me and it's harder for them to keep warm. This can lead to all sorts of complications. They have less resistance to infection. The quality of their lives is badly affected, and in extreme cases, they may need to be hospitalized. According to the newspapers, old people are actually dying of the cold. Is this true? I'm afraid it is. I said before there were two main reasons why we should keep an eye on old people. Well, the other major problem is that so many pensioners cannot afford to heat their homes properly. They may already be living in difficult circumstances. Then, in an exceptionally cold winter such as this one, they may just not have enough money to pay for the extra heating necessary. It seems terrible that in a society such as ours this should be happening. It is. And what the Winter Warmth Code campaign aims to do is to bring this problem to the attention not only of the government, but of everybody else in society. 
We all have a duty towards our old people to make sure that they do not suffer in this cold weather. So now to the practical side of things. What can we do to help? Well, we all know someone old, a relative maybe, a neighbor, someone living round the corner. We should adopt that person and make sure that we spare a few minutes every day to check that everything is okay. Make sure, even if the old person is not actually ill, that he or she is not suffering. Check when you go inside that the house or flat doesn't feel cold to you. It's a good idea to try to feel some part of their body, like their face or hands. Old people can become cold without even noticing it, you know. Okay. And if a person is too poor to afford to heat the house or flat? The best thing, then, is for the old person to live in one room only and to make sure that that one room is warm. Check that the bed is on an inside wall. Move it yourself if necessary. Check the room for drafts. A lot of cold air gets into the room through old windows or badly fitting doors. Is food important? Yes. Make sure that the old person is eating well. You could help by cooking for them or doing the shopping. Remember, a good hot meal a day makes a big difference. Also, make sure that they are well dressed. Old people need to wear more layers of clothes than we do, particularly at night. One last question, Mr. Hastings. Is there nothing the state can do to help? Oh, yes, indeed. Contact your town hall to find out about local organizations already involved in this kind of work. If there is a local Meals on Wheels service, for instance, you could get your adopted old person on the list. Then, of course, there are also many state benefits which an old person could be entitled to, and which he or she doesn't know about, and which therefore he or she is not claiming. An extra problem here is that it can often be complicated, and old people don't like going to Social Security offices to fill in forms and all that. You can help by finding out for them what possibilities exist for claiming a little extra money from the government, then applying for it for them. That little extra could make all the difference. Yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Hastings, thank you for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you. Summary 3 You will hear a short news item. Fill in the gaps in the summary below with the correct word or phrase according to what you hear. The first one has been done for you as an example. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now, listen to the news item and answer the questions. The police are continuing their investigations and, based on new leads, expect to make an early arrest. The drought in northern THR continues to worsen, with tens of thousands of hectares of once lush pastoral land having now been without a single drop of rain for over 11 months. Farmers from the stricken region are beginning to despair, with meteorologists predicting that the drought is unlikely to break before Christmas. Many farmers have begun shooting their worst affected cattle and in some cases, entire flocks of sheep have been destroyed. These measures, tough and cruel though they may seem, are essential to prevent a possible outbreak of widespread disease. It is not only farm animals that are in trouble. Environmentalists are also concerned that the lack of water in rivers, lakes and streams will mean more native animals in the bush will die, unless rain comes soon. They believe the drought could have a lasting effect on the populations of such native animals as kangaroos, wallabies and koalas. Our reporter 
Colin Harrison is in Vance, talking with long-range weather forecaster Joseph Singer. Over to you, Colin. Joseph, can you give any indication as to when we might receive some rain in the affected regions of THR? Well, it's hard to say, of course, but I'm confident that the drought will break within approximately two months. If you look back at the data kept of previous periods of drought over the last hundred years or so, you see a cyclic pattern of severity developing, and we're now at the short end of the last cycle. I'm fairly certain that we'll see some rain either just before or just after Christmas. Let's hope so. Thank you, Joseph. Colin Harrison from the very hot and dry town of Vance in northern THR. Meanwhile, at the CSIRO laboratories in Ottawa, encouraging developments have recently been made in the process of cloud seeding, a process by which clouds can be forced to make rain, and research scientists are to begin conducting trials of a new technique involving lasers later this month. If successful, the state government will be asked to contribute up to $5 million to establish permanent cloud seeding stations in areas most likely to be affected by drought in the future. For many farmers, though, any breakthrough will have come too late. Every week, more farming families are being forced to sell their homes, unable to survive financially, with little or no income to support them. A special assistance fund has been set up to help drought-stricken families. If you would like to send some money, you could do so by calling this number now. 001-43-8172 I'll repeat that number. 001-43-8172 Summary 4 Listen to the conversation between Andrew and Samantha. Complete the summary by writing one suitable word in the numbered spaces. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions. Does your work bring you into contact with many overseas students, Samantha? Occasionally. As you know, a solicitor's work is to advise people about their rights when they have any problems understanding how the law operates. They may need help because of injury to themselves or their property, if they've been attacked or robbed, for example. But these are not by any means the main problems I deal with. Really? We know more about crime, I suppose, because we read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV. What other things do people come to you for help with? There are lots of things which don't get nearly so much attention. Sometimes it's to do with relationships in the community, as when bills aren't paid or contracted work isn't completed or neighbours disagree. At other times, it's to do with people not understanding the law and their responsibilities, and this is probably where overseas students have the most difficulty. One interesting example is customs laws, something which every new arrival has to come up against. What is it that overseas students find most difficult to understand about Australian customs regulations? I think it's a shock to many people arriving here for the first time to find out how many things are prohibited. Everyday food items, for example. I mean, when I've been travelling overseas, I've been quite amazed at the lack of concern in some countries about food being brought in from other parts of the world without any check. You mean people arriving into other countries don't have to declare any foodstuffs at all? In some countries, there are lots of warnings about drugs and firearms, and there are usually limits on alcohol and tobacco, and perhaps perfume. But food's not mentioned. Yes, I suppose I never thought about it till I came here. 
You can take anything you like into England as far as food is concerned. You see, here you can't even drive from one state to another with a few apples and oranges for the journey. There are signs to remind you not to bring any fruit into some states, though they don't usually search your bags unless there's a fruit fly epidemic or something. <laughs> With those kinds of regulations between states, it's no wonder that they're so strict about what you can bring in from overseas. Of course, farmers would be wiped out if some pests were introduced which destroyed their whole crop. It's easy to understand why you should take steps to prevent that. And with food being such an important part of many cultures, it can be difficult for some people to realize they're not allowed to bring in delicacies from home for friends and relatives here. I'm defending someone at the moment who has exactly that problem. Oh,、uh, what happened? It's an interesting case. Have you got time for a cup of coffee? I'll tell you about it if you like. That'd be great. Day seven. Form filling one. Listen to the following conversation carefully, and then complete the forms from different extracts. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, here are the three messages. Message one. I've lost two credit cards. One is a Visa, the other is a Mastercard. What can I do? Don't worry. What's your name, please? My name is Ronald Howard. Howard, H O W A R D. Do you know the numbers of the lost cards, sir? Yes, I wrote them down here. The Visa is number six zero nine one. One three one three nine seven eight one zero two three one, and the Mastercard is number seven two two eight six seven one eight seven two one seven five zero five nine. Do you still remember the expiration date of the cards? Yes, the Visa expires in November two thousand fourteen, and the Mastercard in January two thousand fifteen. Thank you, sir. Could you show me your ID card? Here you are. Thank you. Please come by the office on Wednesday so that we can issue two new cards. Message two. Could you show me the menu, please? Here you are, sir. Will you dine à la carte or the table d'hôte? I think the table d'hôte will do very well for me. Does it include an appetizer, soup, and so forth? Yes, sir. The table d'hôte includes an appetizer, soup, salad, choice of dessert, tea, or coffee. Is there any particular dish you would recommend? The roast duck is very good tonight, and we also have several special chicken dishes if you like chicken. Okay, I'll take the roast duck and some veal. Do you want to drink something? A bottle of beer. Will you order your desserts now? Apple pie, ice cream, or cakes? Apple pie, please, and a cup of coffee. Okay. Wait a minute. I'll bring you the appetizer right away. Message three. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the Ambassador Hotel. Thank you. I've got a reservation through my secretary. My name is Reed. R e a d e. Just a minute, please. Yes, you've got a reservation. A single room for three days. The room number is twelve o one. Here is the key. Thank you. Could you show me your passport? Your passport number. Its number is J D A two one five one six two three. How many pieces of luggage do you have? Just these three: two suitcases and one bag. Okay. Please sign the register here, and the porter will take your luggage to your room. Here is the register. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope you'll enjoy your stay here.
Form filling two. You will hear two people discussing an extramural course. Fill in the information you hear on the application form below. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now, here is the conversation. Hi, Jenny. What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, Steve. Well, I'm trying to fill in this form, but I'm having a bit of a struggle as I sprained my wrist playing tennis yesterday. Don't worry, I'll do it for you. Let's have your pen. Right, fire away. Mm, let's see. I want to do the drama and theatre studies. I'd like to get the certificate. The course number is six o two o one. No, sorry, two o two. It seems to be on Thursday at seven thirty. Yes. Well, we don't have to put all that down. Now, I suppose we can call you Miss. Don't be funny, and spell my name right. Hmm. Well, if you'll have a name like Jenny McPherson. Let's see. It's M A C. No, big M, small C, no A. Right, M C P H E R S O N. Yes, okay, and don't forget it's a capital P, Macpherson. Now, what's your address? Well, I've just moved, so it's six Westway Avenue, Longford. Hang on, don't go so fast. Six Westway Avenue, where? Longford. What's next? Your phone number, daytime and evening. Well, I've only got one, as we can't have calls at school in the daytime. So put down the evening one. Six o five four eight two nine. Four eight two nine. Okay. And you're a teacher. How old are you? Twenty nine. Hmm. Wish I were. No. Thirty-two. Do they want my date of birth? No, don't seem to. Just age.、Uh, how about educational qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in English literature and a diploma in media studies. Media studies, right? Now, have you ever done any of these extramural courses before? No, don't think so. Although I did do something on psychodrama once, but no. It wasn't extramural, was it? That seems to be it, except for the fee. Yes, well, that's the same for all the central courses. I think twenty-five pounds. I suppose I have to include it with this form. <laughs> Looks like it.、Uh, do you want me to write the check out for you? But、uh, you'll have to sign it. Form filling three. Listen to the news report about a robbery, and then complete the notes from the detective's notebook. First, you have some time to read the form. Now, listen to the news report and fill in all the blanks. There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John Brings is at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after eleven thirty, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the、uh, Building Society and asked to see the manager. Uh, there were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office, and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe. Uh, it came to about twenty-five thousand dollars. Presumably, you have a number of witnesses. Yes,、uh, we have a good description of both of them. 
Uh, the man was about 1 meter 80 centimeters, around 35 years of age, with blue eyes and short, curly, red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mr. Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that may be his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. And what about the woman? Now, she is in her early twenties, slim and quite tall, about one meter seventy centimeters. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose-fitting, and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag, which they used to hide the gun in, She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and, like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number. And it's G595ERI. I'll say that again. It's G595ERI. Now, the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago, so if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen, and is still broken, we think. So, you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognise the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon and the telephone number is 774529. So we would like people to ring us if they have any information. Uh, and, of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, is 774529. And now back to the studio. Form filling four. Listen to the results of a radio questionnaire on sports and physical exercises and complete the chart below. First, you have some time to look at the form. Now here is the result of the radio questionnaire. And now the results of our survey on spare time activities and sports. We wanted to know how people spend their spare time, so we interviewed women and men around the town during the whole of last week. Here's what we found out. Only 40% of men interviewed claim to do some kind of physical exercise, while 50% of the women we talked to said that they follow a regular program of exercise. We also talked about watching sport on TV, and both groups claim to spend some time on this. 41% of men interviewed do this and 30% of women. We also wanted to find out exactly what form of exercise these people do. So we asked about different sports and activities. Jogging was by far the most popular, with 20% of men and 18% of women. Most of them do this during the week, either in the morning before going to work or in the evening after work. Football was also popular with the men. 13% claimed to play, mainly at the weekend, on Saturdays. Not surprisingly, none of the women claim to play. Cricket is another popular sport among the men, with 19% claiming to play. Again, no women mentioned this sport. A lot of people also said they took some form of exercise other than these team sports. 80% of men and 90% of women said they regularly walked as a form of exercise, either as part of their daily routine to get to work or at the weekends in their spare time. 
Athletics was also mentioned, but not by many. Only 10% of men said they did this. None of the women we spoke to mentioned it at all. Dancing was also mentioned as a form of exercise. 3% of men and women mentioned this, and also yoga. 5% of women said they did this regularly, and 2% of men. Finally, a small number of people included gardening as a form of exercise. 11% of men said they did this, and 13% of women. Day 8 Sentence Completion 1 Listen to the following lecture about lightning and write no more than three words to complete the following sentences. First, you have some time to read the sentences. Now here is the lecture about lightning. In earliest times, men considered lightning to be one of the great mysteries of nature. Some ancient people believed that lightning and thunder were the weapons of God. In reality, lightning is a flow of electricity formed high above the earth. A single flash of lightning 1.6 kilometers long has enough electricity to light one million light bulbs. The American scientist and statesman Benjamin Franklin was the first to show the connection between electricity and lightning in 1752. In the same year, he also built the first lightning rod. This device protects buildings from damage by lightning. Modern science has discovered that one stroke of lightning contains more than 15 million volts. A spark between a cloud and the earth may be as long as 13 kilometers and travels at a speed of 30 million meters per second. Scientists estimate that there are about 2,000 million flashes of lightning per year. Lightning hits the Empire State Building in New York City 30 to 48 times a year. In the United States alone, it kills an average of one person every day. The safest place to be in case of an electrical storm is in a closed car. Outside, one should go to low ground and not under trees. Also, one should stay out of water and away from metal fences. Inside a house, people should avoid opening doorways and windows and not touch wires or metal things. With lightning, it is better to be safe than sorry. Sentence completion 2. Listen to the following lecture carefully and complete the sentences with no more than three words. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the lecture. These days, we know a lot about contaminated air, contaminated water, and so on. We know that smoke, chemical substances, and dust particles pollute our environment. We're not so familiar with the concept of pollution from noise, and especially with its psychological effects. Generally, the physical effects are not surprising. Partial or complete deafness can result from excessive noises airports, some factories, even some discos. But did you know that it's possible to kill a person with the right or wrong noise? Psychologists now believe that noise has a considerable effect on people's attitudes and behaviour. Experiments have proved that in noisy situations, even temporary ones, people behave more irritably and less cooperatively. In more permanent noisy situations, many people cannot work hard, 
and they suffer from severe anxiety and instability, as well as other psychological problems. However, psychologists distinguish between sound and noise. Sound is measured physically in decibels. Noise cannot be measured in the same way because it refers to the psychological effect of sound, and its level of intensity depends on the situation. Thus, for passengers at an airport who expect to hear aeroplanes taking off and landing, there may be a lot of sound, but not much noise. That is, they're not bothered by the noise. By contrast, if you're at a concert and two people behind you are whispering, you feel they're talking noisily, even if there is not much sound. You notice the noise because it affects you psychologically. Both sound and noise can have negative effects, but what is important is if the person has control over the sound. People walking down the street with stereo earphones, listening to music that they enjoy, are receiving a lot of decibels of sound. But they're probably happy hearing sounds which they control. On the other hand, people in the street without stereo earphones must tolerate a lot of noise which they have no control over. It is noise pollution that we need to control in order to help people live more happily. Sentence completion three. Listen to the interview between a police inspector and a witness to a robbery, and then fill in the missing information. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now. Listen to the interview. Now, Mr. Wilson, we'd like to ask you a few questions about the robbery you witnessed the Tuesday before last, the fifteenth of September. Oh, but I had an interview with one of your officers the day after. Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. But there are still one or two little details we'd like to get absolutely clear. So, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. I I'm glad to help. What would you like to know? Well, sir, first of all, we'd like to know the registration number of the Ford Fiesta. The number you gave us on the sixteenth was Y E A six one O J. Are you absolutely sure that was the correct registration? Gosh, I can't remember the exact registration now. I mean, it was ten days ago. Um. Yes, I do remember thinking that's easy. It almost looks like year, and I'm sure the last letter was J for Jimmy. That's my name, you know. But the numbers, well, I've no idea now, really. You see, Mr. Wilson, we had another witness who told us the numbers were six o one, not six one o. Oh dear. Um. All I can say is, I gave you the numbers that I thought I saw at the time. Okay, Mr. Wilson. Can you go over the events as you remember them? Um. I. Uh, I was on my way home from the chemist's. It was about twenty-five to six. I just bought some cough mixture for my little boy, and. How can you be sure about the time? Well, I'd just been to the chemist, as I say, and I remember saying to the girl, "Well, I suppose you must be glad the day's over." And she said, "Oh no, not today. We do normally shut at five thirty, but it's our late night tonight. Unfortunately, we don't shut till a quarter to eight. So another two and a quarter hours to go." So it was five thirty-five. Yes, and just as I was going to cross the road, I saw two men run out of the pub opposite, jump into the red Ford Fiesta, and drive off at top speed. There was a driver already in the car waiting for them, of course. So there were three of them altogether. Yes, and we found out that one of the barmen in the pub was the one who organised it all. He handed the money over to the two blokes who went into the pub. Ah, so you've arrested them all now? 
All but one, sir. That's why evidence could be crucial. Sentence completion four. Listen to the following talk about man and apes, and then complete the sentences with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now, listen to the talk and answer questions one to six. Man has always been interested in apes because they are at the same time so like him and so unlike him. In their basic anatomy or body structure, they are very similar, and for this reason, they are both classified as primates, the highest form of animal. They also resemble each other in having hands and feet instead of claws like cats or hooves like horses. Likewise, neither has a tail. Both men and apes have large brains compared to their body size, and this helps again to distinguish them from other species of animals. But compared to the chimpanzee, for example. Man's brain is four times as large. Like man, apes can use tools. For example, an ape may pick up a stick and put it in an ant's nest to make the ants come out. Similarly, apes have been known to make tools. For example, by breaking off branches to use as sticks. Man, however, is quite different. In fact, unique among animals because he can make a plan and then make a tool by following that plan. All human beings everywhere have a language, and there are thousands of different languages in the world. All these languages are equally complex, and they are very different from the cries of apes and other animals. Finally. We can use fire making to differentiate men from apes. Man has possessed the secret of making fire for thousands of years. In contrast, neither apes nor any other animals possess this secret. Sentence completion mixed. Listen to an interview. Mr. Brooks, Mark. Jean and Robert are being interviewed on the subject of friendship. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now, listen to the interview and answer questions one to ten. I consider friendship to be one of the most important things in life, whatever your status, married or single. I see too many lonely people around. A lot of us get so involved with material values, family problems, keeping up with the Joneses, etc., that we forget the real meaning of friendship. Which is what, according to you? They say a friend in need is a friend indeed, which is partly true. But a real friend should also be able to share your happy moments without feeling jealous. A good friendship is one where you can accept and forgive him, understand mood, and don't feel hurt if a friend doesn't feel like seeing you. Of course, honesty is an essential part of any relationship. We should learn to accept our friends for what they are. As a married man. Do you find your friendship is only with other men? Of course not. Both my wife and I have men and women friends. Thank goodness. Although family life is fulfilling, it isn't enough. Both my wife and I get tremendous satisfaction from our friends, married or single, male and female, and we both have our separate friends too. We'd get bored with each other if we had the same friends. You must have a full life. We certainly do. And as I say, our friendship gives us a lot of pleasure. After all, friends should not be people with whom you kill time. 
Real friendship, in my opinion, is a spiritually developing experience. I've never had a lot of friends. I've never regarded them as particularly important. Perhaps that's because I come from a big family, two brothers and three sisters, and lots of cousins. And that's what's really important in my family. If you really need help, you get it from your family, don't you? Well, at least that's what I've always found. What about you, Jean? To me, friendship, having friends, people I know I can really count on. To me, that's the most important thing in life. It's more important even than love. If you love someone, you can always fall out of love again, and that can lead to a lot of hurt feelings, bitterness, and so on. But a good friend is a friend for life. And what exactly do you mean by a friend? Well, I've already said, someone you know you can count on. I suppose, what I really mean is, let's see, how am I going to put this? It's someone who will help you if you need help, who will listen to you when you talk about your problems, someone you can trust. What do you mean by a friend, Robert? Who likes the same things that you do? Who you can argue with and not lose your temper, even if you don't always agree about things. I mean. Someone who you don't have to talk to all the time, but can be silent with, perhaps. That's important too. You can just sit together and not say very much. Sometimes, just relax. I don't like people who talk all the time. Are you very good at keeping in touch with your friends if you don't see them regularly? No, not always. I've lived in lots of places and. To be honest, once I move away, I often do drift out of touch with my friends, and I'm not a very good letter writer either. Never have been, but I know that if I saw those friends again, if I ever moved back to the same place, or for some other reasons we got back into close contact again, I'm sure the friendship would be just as strong as it was before. Several of my friends have moved away, got married, things like that. One of my friends has had a baby recently, and I'll admit I don't see or hear from her as much as I used to. She lives in another neighbourhood, and when I phone her, she always seems busy. But that's an exception. I write a lot of letters to my friends, and get a lot of letters from them. I have a friend I went to school with, and ten years ago she emigrated to Canada, but she still writes to me every month, and I write to her just as often. Day nine. Matching one. Listen to the introduction about Tower Bridge and complete the summary. Use words or phrases from the box. There are more words in the box than you need. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the talk. Tower Bridge is located in one of the most interesting parts of London. On either top of the tower, you can get a bird's eye view of the wonderful scenery all round Tower Bridge. On its south side are many tall old buildings. On its north side stands the Tower of London itself. But Tower Bridge, the first bridge over the Thames as you travel to London from the sea, is the most famous of them all. Although they look the same age, the tower is almost a thousand years old. And Tower Bridge, which was built in the 1890s, is just over 100. Because of the tall ships up and down the Thames, it was proposed in 1850 that a bridge across the Thames near the tower was most necessary. However, the designers argued about the new bridge for about 30 years. They took so long because they had two big problems. 
One is that the new bridge must look like the old tower, and the other is that the bridge must not look like a modern bridge. They made it look like the old tower, so everyone was happy. Besides, the most surprising thing about Tower Bridge is that it opens in the middle while big ships are going through to the Pool of London. If you're lucky enough to see the bridge with its two opening arms high in the air, you'll never forget it. The bridge took eight years to build and cost nine hundred thousand pounds, a lot of money in those days. But it was a wonderful success and became a famous tourist attraction in London on the day when the bridge was completed. A hundred years ago, the Thames was once London's busiest traffic route, so that the bridge opened at least twelve times a day. Today, big ships don't go so far up the Thames. Tower Bridge opens perhaps only twice a week. But the same wonderful machinery is still in good condition. Green, yellow, and red—the colourful wheels and engines—look smart and new, not a hundred years old. They still lift the two heavy opening arms, each one thousand tons, leaving seventy metres for the ships to go through. And they still can open and close the bridge in one and a half minutes. Things are changing greatly now at Tower Bridge. The horses that used to help with pulling have gone, and so have the tugs, for they are no longer necessary. The walkways from one tower to the other at the top of the bridge were closed years ago because so many people jumped off them into the Thames, which is said to open again soon. In addition, the beautiful wheels will be part of a special exhibition for the public to visit. There'll be a restaurant in one of the towers and a pub in the other, but whatever happens in its exciting future, Tower Bridge will always mean London. Matching two. Listen to a travel agent discussing a holiday booking with two lady customers, and then choose from the list of countries the ones which are mentioned in the dialogue. And then match them up with the reasons why the two customers didn't want to go there. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now, listen to the conversation.、Uh, good morning. Can I help you? Yes. Good morning. We'd like to book a holiday for July, please. Certainly.、Uh, where did you have in mind? Oh well, we haven't thought a lot about it really. We just like to go somewhere hot, you know, and it must be in July. I see. Well, let's get the dates cleared up first, then we can see about availability. What part of July were you thinking of? Ah,、oh, well, you see. We have slightly different holidays. I've got the whole month except for the last four days, so I could go from the first to the twenty-seventh. But my friend here doesn't start until the seventh, so I suppose it will have to be in the middle two weeks, really. Yes, but I've got to be back by the twenty-fourth. Okay. Now let's find a destination. Any preferences? Spain, Greece, Portugal. Oh, not Spain. We went there last year, and it was absolutely packed with teenagers making noise and getting drunk all the time. Yes, it was terrible. We definitely want somewhere quieter this year. Well, of course, it depends more on the resort rather than the country. There are resorts in every country which cater for the family or the slightly older person. They're usually a shade more expensive, though, as you might expect. Oh well, we don't mind paying a bit more if it means more peace and quiet, do we? Definitely not. It'd be well worth it. All right, let's have a look at what we've got on the computer. July. Was it ten or fourteen nights you wanted? Oh, the fortnight, please. Right. Well, let's start with Italy. 
Um, we've got fourteen nights' bed and breakfast in Sorrento for three hundred and forty-five pounds from Manchester on the fourteenth. Or we've got no. Wait a minute. That's no good for me. We wouldn't get back till the twenty-eighth, and I've got to be back at work before that. Ah, uh, yes. Um, how about Opatidia?、Uh, two weeks half board. Where's that? Yugoslavia, madam.、Uh, northern part. Nice little place.、Uh, that would be three hundred and ten pounds from Manchester again. Yugoslavia? Oh, but I've been told the beaches aren't very nice there. Well, again, it depends on where you go. In Opatidia,、uh, they have those big wooden platforms, you know, with some bits. So there's no beach as such, but the water is beautifully clean. And oh no, I think we prefer a real beach. You know, I like a bit of sand. <laughs> huh. All right. How about Greece, the Greek islands? We have several holidays there. Spetsa, Kos, departures every Tuesday, and it's quite economical, really, because it's all on a self-catering basis. So, oh, what about hotels? We'd prefer to be in a nice hotel, I think. What about you, Kath? Oh yes, I can't be bothered with cooking your own meals and all that sort of thing. I like to forget about all that when I go on holiday. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid it's all self-catering we do for the Greek islands. How about the mainland? There's a dual centre holiday here: Athens and Delphi, seven days in each. That would come to. Oh, just a minute! Isn't it a bit sweltering in Athens at that time of year? Well, it's not exactly the coldest place in Europe. <laughs> Let's see. The average temperature in July is twenty-nine centigrade. That's eighty-one Fahrenheit. Oh God, no! I think we just die in all that heat. I mean, the coast's bad enough, but in a city. All right, let's try somewhere else. How about Portugal? Oh, that sounds great. We've never been there, have we? Let's see now. We've got fourteen nights in Albufeira. Half board from Gatwick for three hundred and eighty-five pounds. Albufera? Oh, wait a minute! Did you say the flight was from London? Oh well, really, we'd prefer a flight from the north somewhere, Manchester perhaps, or even Glasgow. Right. There's a twelve-night holiday in Lagos. That's near Albufera from Manchester on the eleventh. For four hundred and fifty-five pounds. Oh, that's a bit pricey, isn't it? Why is it so much more than the other one? Well, madam, there's a surcharge for the airport, and it's a five-star hotel. Oh well, it's a bit over our budget, really. Matching three. Listen to the following conversation. And choose your answers from the box below. There are more words than spaces, so you will not use them all. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the conversation. Well, come on then. Let's see what you've bought. Let me get my coat off first. What a day! The shops are packed, and trying to get served is murder. I got most of what I wanted, but I think I'll have to go back up another day for a few more odds and ends. What is this? A camera? Yes, I got it for my sister's boyfriend. They're always going off at the weekend, bird watching. And they were saying the other day that they needed a new one. It was incredibly expensive. It put me back thirty pounds fifty. Can you imagine? Gosh, those cufflinks are nice. Are they real gold? Good heavens, no! They're only metal and leather. I thought I'd give them to my father-in-law. He's the only one I know who actually wears cufflinks these days. 
I thought they were quite a bargain, only thirteen pounds sixty. Mmm, yes. That cocktail shaker looks nice. It's not silver, is it? No, I'm afraid not. Just metal. I got it for my doctor. Your doctor? Yes, I always give her something. It's a tradition. It was quite cheap, only ten quid. What else have you got then? Well, I found this really nice scarf. You'd like it. Oh yes, how soft it is! It must be cashmere or something. Uh, I think it's a mixture of wool and silk. Actually, I'm going to give it to my mother-in-law. They're her sort of colours. And what about this toolkit? I suppose that's for Tom, and that old banger he's got. Well, no, I bought that for my mother actually. She's always saying she wants one for the car and never gets around to buying one. I'm not surprised. The price it cost. How much was it? I could do with one myself. It was fifteen pounds, I think. Look, there's the label: fifteen pounds thirty. Gosh! And then I got this pair of pajamas. Aren't they wonderful? They're silk, just like the ones in that TV ad. I got them for my brother. Do you think he'll like them? Mmm. Wow. I bet they cost a fortune. Mmm. Yes. Forty pounds. Well, he'd better like them, hadn't he? I think your budget isn't in the same bracket as mine. Matching four. You will hear a telephone conversation between two people discussing car rental. Look at questions one to eleven and fill in the summary with the missing words from the following box. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the telephone conversation. Hello, Hertz Cars. Good afternoon. Is that Hertz Car Rental? It is. What can I do for you? I'd like some information about renting cars in the states, please. Certainly, madam. What would you like to know? Well, I just wanted to get some information about how much it costs and so on. Of course. Well, let me start by asking: Are you going by yourself or with someone else? Or with other? Yes, I'm going with my husband, and we're going with friends, another married couple. Right. So that's four adults, no children or anything. No, just us. So you'll be looking at the smaller car range, I should think. Yes, I suppose so. Well, the four smaller car categories are J and A, both subcompact, then B compact. Compact. Yes, subcompact is something like a Ford Escort. Compact, um, a Mercury, um, a Mercury Lynx, for example, and C mid-size, the size of a Ford Fairmont, that sort of size. I see. We've got an Escort ourselves, actually, so I know that one. But what's the difference between the others? Well, you could think about the seating, for example. Category C cars seat five adults, but you don't need that, do you? The other three, J, A, and B, seat four adults. Then there's luggage capacity to think about. Actually, there's not much difference there. They all hold about the same amount of luggage. Are you travelling with a lot of luggage? No, just normal. Well, we don't need to worry about that then. Now another thing to think about is how many miles per gallon you can get out of the car. The first three do twenty-nine miles to the gallon, but category C only does twenty-two, so you'll be paying more for petrol if you rent that one. I see. And in fact, the full tank in category C cars doesn't last so long. I mean, on a full tank with the first three categories. You can do three hundred and twenty-eight miles, but with category C, it's only three hundred and eight. Oh well, let's forget category C then. Could we just check that I've understood everything correctly so far? The others all hold four adults, have the same luggage space, and do let me see, twenty-nine miles per gallon. 
and you can get 308 miles out of a full tank. Have I got that right? Um, yes. Uh, uh, no, no, not 308. 328 miles on a full tank. Oh, right. 328 miles. Now the important question. What about costs? What do they all cost? Well, Category J costs £89 per week, Category A £109, and Category B £119. Right. Oh, what's the difference between J and A, by the way? You said before that they were both subcompact. Yes, A, uh, which is slightly more expensive, is automatic, whereas J is only manual. I see. Right, I've got all that. Well, I must go and discuss it with the others, and then I'll get back to you. Thanks for your help. It's been very useful. Not at all. Glad to be of assistance. Goodbye. Goodbye. Matching 5 Listen to a travel agent talking about interesting places to visit in Wales. Match the correct activities and beaches with each place. Some of the choices may be used more than once. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the talk. The trouble with a long weekend in Wales is that a long weekend is too short. There just isn't enough weekend for what Wales has to offer. Take the Welsh coastline. Whichever way you like your sand, you'll find it in Wales. For the active, there are surfing beaches all round the coast. At Marlow Sands, at Aberdaron, and particularly at Rossilli Beach on the Gower Peninsula, which offers some of the best surf in Europe. Sailing, too, is widely available with yachting centres such as Tenby in the south, Aberdovey in mid Wales, and Abersoch on the Len Peninsula in the north. There are big open beaches and there are small secluded bays and coves. The six miles of pending sands, for instance, in Carmarthen Bay, are so long and wide that they are frequently used for different kinds of racing events. While Landwind Bay, on a southern corner of Anglesey, offers four miles of sand and dune and countless vantages for the spectacular view across the bay to, to Snowdonia, Barafanlul Bay in the Pembrokeshire National Park is as secluded as they come, and like Munt, a golden sandy beach trapped in a tiny sheltered cove at the southern end of Cardigan Bay, basks in tranquility. And of course, there are many old fishing villages, Langranog and Barmouth among them, whose charm has increased as the fleets of ships have declined. These days, you see, the fishing in Wales is much more for pleasure than profit. For sea fishermen, rivers like the Dee and the Usk provide some of the most available salmon fishing in the UK. Is it any wonder that Wales lures fishermen in droves? And is it any wonder that there are hundreds of cosy lake and riverside inns to accommodate them? Wales is teeming with interesting places to stay and interesting things to do. Day 10 Matching the Pictures 1 Listen to the conversation between Daniel, a Spanish student, and Kira from Greece. Kira is asking about medicine for a cold. And then answer the following questions. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the conversation. 
Hello, Daniel. How are you? Not so bad, thanks. What about you? To tell the truth, I've got a terrible cold. Ah, oh, sorry to hear that. Poor you. Maybe it's the change in the weather, or maybe you've been working too hard lately. Well, it must be the weather. Bless you. Have you taken any medicine? No, I haven't. Can you recommend anything? Now let me see. I got some tablets a couple of months ago when I had a cold. Do you remember the name? Not exactly, but they were black and white capsules, sort of cylindrical shaped, and the label on the bottle had a name printed at the top in block letters, and I think the bottle was square. I'm not exactly sure. The name might have been something like Vigilan or Vegilan. How is it spelt? If I remember correctly, it's V E G I L A N. Vegilan. I'll just make a note of that. Thanks. Not at all, and I hope you feel better soon. Me too. By the way, Daniel, where is the nearest chemist? Oh, that's easy. From here, you go directly south to the second main street, and then you turn left. Continue straight along past the church. And at the next intersection, turn right. It's on the left, the second shop after the bank,、uh, which is on the corner. You can't miss it. I think I know it. It's just opposite the shoe shop, and there's a green grocer's between it and the bank. You got it. Mind how you go. Thanks. Well, I'm off now. Bye. Cheerio. See you soon. Matching the pictures too. The phone rings in Pierre's room. Hilary has just been informed that Pierre's flight will be delayed by two hours, so Pierre decides to visit the shopping centre in Southtown. As you listen, mark the route Hilary describes on the map below, and indicate the beginning of the main shopping street. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now listen to the conversation. Hello, hello. Pierre Farabellini speaking. Mr. Farabellini, this is Hilary Beecham from Compact. Oh, hello, Hilary. I've got some bad news for you. I've just checked with the airport, and I've heard that your plane will be delayed by two hours.、Oh, I see. Well, what do you think? Well, first of all, your taxi is due to arrive in half an hour. Well, I really don't want to spend all that time waiting at the airport.、Uh, could you book it a bit later? Yes, certainly. So I think I'll go into South Town and do a bit of shopping, buy a few presents for the family. Where's the best place to go to look at the shops? It's quite difficult to explain. Let me think. It'd be much easier if you had a map. Just a moment. I've got one in my pocket. Right. Okay. In that case, I'll explain how to get to the town centre from the hotel. It's about a fifteen-minute walk, or you could go by taxi. No, I'm quite happy to stretch my legs. Well, you turn right out of the hotel and carry straight on for about two hundred metres. Then you come to a roundabout. Take the first exit. I mean, to go left. So right out of the hotel, then I go straight on until I come to a roundabout, and then I take the first exit. Yes, that's right. Then you walk along there for about another hundred and fifty meters, and then you come to another roundabout. There you go right. So I go to the next roundabout and turn right. Yes. And then you carry on for another hundred meters, and then you come to a third roundabout. There, you go straight over the roundabout, and then take the first left. Hang on a minute. Let me just check that I've got that. I go to the next roundabout, go straight over, and then take the first on my left. Yes. Then at the next junction, turn right, and then immediately left, and that's the beginning of the main shopping area. Okay, 
Uh, just let me go over that last bit. I carry on into the next junction and turn left and then right. No, the other way round. At the junction, you turn right and then left. Okay, I've got it. Thanks very much. Oh, don't mention it. I hope you find something for your family. Oh, yes, I nearly forgot. I'll ask the taxi to collect you from the hotel at five o'clock. At five, that's fine. Bye. Bye. Matching the pictures three. Mr. John Tankle and his wife Rose Tankle, the owners of a private hotel, are waiting for a guest to check in. Study the example and questions one to six. For each question, there are four pictures. Decide which of the pictures best corresponds to what you hear on the tape. Circle the letter under that picture. The first one has been done for you as an example. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the conversation. Hello, Evergreen Hotel, can I help you? Yes, good afternoon. I wonder if you have a single room with a private bathroom for tonight, please? Let me just check. Single room with private bathroom just for tonight. Yes, we have a vacancy. Would you like to make a booking? No, I'll come around now if that's OK. What's the address, please? 239 Smith Street. I'll just write that down. 239 Smith Street. OK, I'll see you in about 30 minutes. Goodbye. John, we've got a guest coming. We can put her in number eight. Dear me, it's getting dark earlier and earlier. What time is it, Rose? 4.30. Oh, that Mr. Lieber should be checking in soon, shouldn't he? He said in his letter that his flight was due in at 3.10 and that he'd be coming straight here from the airport. By the time he gets here, it'll probably be 5.30. There's a lot of traffic at this time of day. Wait a minute. There's someone coming in now. Hello. Good to see you. You must be Mr. Lieber. How was your flight? Not too bad. Once I've had a shower and a shave, though, I'll be a different person. Hello, Mr. Lieber. You got in earlier than expected. It's just gone half past four. Yes, well, the traffic wasn't too bad. My flight came in 15 minutes earlier as well. And that's the TV lounge over there. Now, breakfast is at eight and dinner at six. Well, here's the key to your room. I think you'll like it. Number seven's on the first floor, next door to the bar. It's got a lovely view. It looks onto the lake and the park. Oh, uh, by the way, I'm expecting somebody over in about 20 minutes. As soon as I've unpacked, I'll come downstairs. So could you tell him that I'll be waiting in the TV lounge? Yes, certainly. He's an Australian, a very tall man with glasses. You can't miss him. I'll keep an eye open for him. Oh, by the way, will you be wanting an early morning alarm call? Later that afternoon, after his meeting, Mr. Lieber asked Mrs. Tankle for street directions. As you listen, decide which picture best fits the information given. Hello, Mr. Lieber. Your visitor found you. Yes, thanks. Uh, listen, listen, I have to get into town. Which is the best way to get to the city centre from here? It's not very far at all. There's a taxi rank in the square just at the end of the street here, or you could even walk. It's about half an hour's walk, if you're not feeling too jet-lagged. There's a train service from Martin Street Station, but it'd take you about 15 minutes to get to the station from here. What part of the city do you want? I need to get to the Australian consulate. Uh, do you know where that is? 
let me have a look. Oh, right. Your best bet in that case would be the bus. There's a stop on the opposite side of this road. Can you see it? Just past that red coach. You can get off at the Grey Hall. It's, uh, let me see, one, two, three, yeah, three stops down. Better ask the conductor to tell you when you're there just to be on the safe side. When you're at Grey Hall, just keep on walking to the end of the block. Turn left into MacDonald Street and you'll see a big cinema on the right. The consulate's just opposite. You can't miss it. Yeah, yeah. Opposite the cinema in MacDonald Street. That sounds easy enough. Thanks very much. See you at dinner. Uh, 5.30, wasn't it? Day 11 Providing Short Answers 1 Listen to the following news and answer the questions. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now listen to the news. Good evening, everyone. Here is the summary of the news. Shots were fired in a South London street by escaping bank robbers. Four rock fans died in a stampede at a concert in Chicago. And how an Air France Concorde was involved in the closest recorded miss in aviation history. Now the news in detail. Shots were fired this morning in the course of an 80 mile per hour chase along Brixton High Road in London. A police constable was injured by flying glass when a bullet shattered his windscreen as he was pursuing a car containing four men who had earlier raided a branch of Barclays Bank at Stockwell. Police constable Robert Cranley had been patrolling near the bank when the alarm was given. The raiders made their getaway in a stolen Jaguar, which was later found abandoned in Croydon. Officials of the bank later announced that £16,000 had been stolen. Four people were killed and more than 50 injured when fans rushed to get into a stadium in Chicago yesterday where the British pop group Fantasy were giving a concert. The incident occurred when gates were opened to admit a huge crowd of young people waiting outside the stadium for the sale of unreserved seat tickets. People were knocked over in the rush and trampled underfoot as the crowd surged forward. The concert later went ahead as planned, with fantasy unaware of what had happened. A police spokesman said that they had decided to allow the concert to proceed in order to avoid further trouble. There has been criticism of the concert organisers for ensuring that all the tickets were sold in advance. Roy Thompson, leader of Fantasy, said afterwards that the whole group was shattered when they heard what had happened. They are now considering calling off the rest of the United States tour. The United States Air Force has admitted that a formation of its fighters and an Air France Concorde recently missed colliding by as little as 10 feet. The Air Force accepts the blame for what was the closest recorded miss in aviation history. According to the Air Force spokesman, when the Concorde was already 70 miles out over the Atlantic on a scheduled flight to Paris from Dulles International Airport, Washington, four U.S. Air Force F-15s approached at a speed from the left. The lead plane missed the underside of Concorde's nose by 10 feet, while another passed only 15 feet in front of the cockpit. Forest fires in the south of France have claimed the life of another fireman as they continue to rage in the hills between Fréjus and Cannes. Fanned by strong westerly winds, the flames are now threatening several villages and many holiday homes have had to be abandoned. The French army was called in yesterday to assist the 1,500 firefighters that have so far been unable to contain the spread of the blaze. And that's the end of the news. Providing short answers to
Listen to a phone call between a mother and her daughter and answer questions one to six with no more than three words according to what you hear from the conversation. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the phone call. Hi, Mum. How are things? Oh, hello, Jane. Are you all right? Yeah, great. I just thought I'd phone to let you know we're OK. It's all really wonderful. The weather's fantastic. I'm sitting here in short sleeves and I'm still hot. I can't believe it's December. Did you get my card? No. The postman hasn't been here for a couple of days. But you know what the post's like at this time of the year. They've probably got a backlog to catch up on. How was your flight in the end, by the way? Oh, awful. It was a typical charter. We were delayed and had to sit around for hours, so we didn't take off until after midnight. And it was five in the morning before we got to the hotel. Oh, dear. What a pity. But we're waking up for it now. On Monday, we had a great day in the beach. Just lying in the sun and swimming. The water's lovely. You know, not at all cold. That was to recover from Sunday when we hired a car from one of those rent-a-car agencies and drove all around the island, up into the mountains. It was really spectacular. I mean, the scenery is wonderful. Oh, that's good. I can see you're going to have a good fortnight. Yeah, it's all going by too fast. A fortnight is too short. I wish now we'd book for three weeks instead. Still, can't be helped. Listen, do you think you could come and meet us when we get back? The plane gets in at about 6.15 on the 8th. Let's see, I have the tickets here. Yes, it says arrive 6.15 on January the 8th. Yes, of course, dear. Don't worry, we'll be there. Now, just make sure you put lots of cream on if you're lying in the sun in all that heat. Well, actually, I fell asleep on the beach the other day and had a really red nose, all peeling and burnt. Well, be careful. And what's John up to? Oh, he's having a lie down. He isn't feeling very well today. I think it's something he ate. We had a big meal out last night, so perhaps the food was too heavy. You know... They eat really late here. We still have another hour before dinner. Good heavens. We had our supper hours ago. Providing short answers, three. Listen to the following interview and answer the questions with no more than three words. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the interview. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Do sit down. Now, tell me, what made you apply for this job? Well, I've been wanting to improve my position for some time, and it seemed to me that the job you advertised would give me an opportunity to learn more about marketing and sales techniques in general. Where are you working at present, Mr. Brown? Well, actually, I haven't got a job at the moment. I had a job as chief clerk in the buying department of a retail store, Johnson & King. I expect you've heard of them. But to tell the truth, I didn't quite hit it off with the sales manager. Oh, why was that, Mr Brown? Well, he was rather old-fashioned in his methods, and the sales policy of the firm seemed to me too slow. I'm a great believer in the personal approach to selling. I took a course in business management at the London Commercial College, and I'm afraid I found Johnson & King's methods very out of date. They first opened in 1880, you know, and I don't think they've changed their ideas since then. Really? In that case, you may be interested to know that our firm first started business in 1870. And we believe that the old slogan, the customer is always right, still holds good today. 
I'm afraid our chairman, Samuel Jackson, great-great-grandson of the original founder of the firm, Josiah Jackson, does not approve of high-powered modern selling technique, and with some justification as our export figures show. We base all our sales technique on Peterson's theory of salesmanship, published in 1900. I, I presume you've read it. Oh, well, actually, no. But I'll make a point of getting one from my local library without delay. Do that, Mr. Brown, and then come and see me again. Providing short answers for Listen to the following talk between two friends and answer the questions with no more than three words. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the talk. Do you know what, Tom? It won't be long before we'll all be travelling to space in a cable car. A cable car? What do you mean? A sort of sky lift? Well, yes, I suppose so. You must be joking. Where on earth did you get that idea from? Oh, I've just been reading it in a book called Apes to Astronauts by Adrian Berry. He's the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, so he should know what he's talking about. He says, wait a minute, I've got it here, page 28. A cable car to the heavens. Oh, honestly, Jane, you surely don't believe all that stuff you read in those sci-fi books. It's not science fiction. It's a fact. Hang on. I'll read you what he says. The space writer, Arthur C. Clarke, to whose inspiration we owe the communications satellite, recently outlined a proposal for a new means of space travel, which, he admitted, is so outrageous that many of you may consider it not even science fiction, but pure fantasy. Shall I go on? No, just tell me how he thinks it could be done. Well, it sounds quite simple, really. One end of a cable, 23,000 miles long. How long? 23,000 miles. Do listen. One end of a cable, 23,000 miles long, would be attached to a point on the Earth's equator and the other to a satellite in geostationary orbit. So? The cable would be absolutely tight between the two points and the elevator would travel up and down, carrying people and freight. According to Arthur Clarke, it's the only way to travel in space without using rocket engines, which would make it much more economical. I wonder if it would be more comfortable. It sounds pretty uncomfortable to me. And heaven knows what speed it would be travelling at. Uh, what would happen if the cable broke? Oh, he explains all that. Apparently, the most likely place for it to break would be at or near the ground. And if that happened, it wouldn't fall down. It would fall upwards. Upwards? Hmm. Yes, I suppose it would. Yes. Sounds funny, doesn't it? Something falling upwards. Anyway, it wouldn't matter too much either if the cable broke away from the high end. It would remain rigid until it could be reattached to the satellite. I don't quite see why. Well, it would be the pull of gravity from above. Anyway, who'd want to be stuck in an elevator attached to a rigid cable thousands of miles up in space? I suppose he doesn't say what would happen if it broke in the middle. Actually, he does. He says it would be dangerous if the break occurred at any altitude up to 15,000 miles because the bit attached to the Earth would... What does he say? Oh, yes. Collapse and wrap itself around the equator like a whiplash. Whiplash? You know, the long bit of cord or leather on a whip. Anyway, even that would only be really catastrophic if the cable was made of steel or some other metal. Metals are much too heavy. The cable would have to be made of some material capable of suspension without snapping. 
but I thought you said the cable would be 23,000 miles long. I did, but the 3,000 mile breaking length is because of gravity. Well, all I can say is you'll never catch me going to space in a cable car. I'd rather keep my feet on the ground, thank you very much. Providing short answers, five. Listen to the following talk about UFOs and answer questions one to eight with no more than four words. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the talk. Do UFOs really exist? This question divides people into two sharply opposing camps, the believers and the non-believers. The former is quite convinced that extraterrestrials exist and travel around the universe in flying saucers. The non-believers are sure that the only form of life exists here on Earth and that any UFO sightings can be scientifically explained as purely terrestrial phenomena. So let's take the believers first and see what evidence they have to support their belief. For many years, there have been reports of strange flying objects, and in 1947, the name of unidentified flying objects, or UFOs, was given to these phenomena. Many of the reports of UFOs have a curious similarity. The objects are generally described as disc or cigar-shaped. In daylight, they appear silvery, often luminous or surrounded by an aura. At night, they have the appearance of bright lights, often yellow-red in color. They are said to travel at high speed and accelerate rapidly, frequently disappearing suddenly. A sound, described as a low hum or swish, has been heard when the UFOs appear, and they sometimes stop and hover or rotate over certain spots, as though observing something. These reports have come from all types of people. Policemen, farmers, walkers, aircraft pilots, children, housewives. In fact, no one class can be selected as being particularly susceptible to sightings. Perhaps, though, the most convincing evidence has come from the aircraft pilots whose visual sightings have been supported by radar tracking. Most radar operators have compared the UFOs on their radar screens to large aircraft, though they have an unexpected manner of simply vanishing, unlike a normal aircraft. Certain photographic evidence of UFOs has also been produced, although many of the prints are unclear or blurred. But the most astonishing reports have been of close encounters with UFOs. Dr. Hynek, director of the Center for UFO Studies in Illinois, USA, has classified these encounters as of three kinds. A close encounter of the first kind is when a witness reports seeing a UFO within a few hundred meters, often when it has landed on the ground. A close encounter of the second kind is when the UFO has left a physical trace, such as an indentation or scorching of the ground, a burnt area of vegetation or broken telephone wires or tree branches. A close encounter of the third kind is when people report actual contact with alien beings. Here, the descriptions vary widely from reports of normal-looking humans, generally wearing unusual clothes or speaking a strange language, to those little green men with four legs. This third kind of encounter is the most difficult to believe in, although many of the witnesses appear to be sensible men and women not given to lying. From all the different kinds of report, 
there seems to emerge a general pattern of UFOs. There is a high level of agreement on the shape, color, movement, and sound of UFOs, but far less coherence when describing extraterrestrial beings. To the non-believers, they don't exist. In fact, the non-believers state quite categorically that all UFOs have a scientific explanation. They are either natural phenomena, such as ball lightning, marsh gas, comets, or northern lights, or they are aircraft seen from an unusual angle. Non-believers also suggest UFOs might be planes or rockets which are on government secret lists and therefore of designs unknown to the public. They discount the evidence of radar sightings as the screens sometimes show up radar shadows or mirages of things which do not exist. Photographs are dismissed as fakes or as pictures of aircraft taken from unusual angles. Finally, the three types of close encounters are discounted by the non-believers as hoaxes, hallucinations, or people misinterpreting information. The first kind of encounter can be accounted for in the same way as a flying saucer seen in the air, as a natural phenomenon. The second kind of encounter usually has a natural cause, the heat marks resulting from fires caused by lightning or people's carelessness, the telephone wires and branches being blown down by high winds, and the indentations resulting from subsidence of the land. The third kind of encounter is generally disbelieved because no photographic or taped evidence exists. It is also felt that the witnesses may have been suffering from abnormal mental or physical states at the time. So, to sum up, it is very difficult to say whether UFOs definitely exist or not. The evidence for their existence is rather weak. But on the other hand, there are certain strange phenomena which cannot be explained scientifically at the moment. Perhaps we can leave the subject with a quote from Dr. Hynek. Maybe the whole phenomenon is not as mysterious as we think. After all, a hundred years ago, we knew nothing about nuclear energy. Maybe our scientific knowledge is just not advanced enough to explain UFOs. In the meantime, reports will continue to pour into the Center for UFO Studies and spotters all over the world will continue to watch the skies for signs of man from outer space. Day 12 True or False 1 Listen to the extract of a television travel program and then decide whether each of the statements below is true or false. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the extract. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Your Holiday. And in tonight's programme, we'll have reports on Sardinia, Austria, the Black Sea coast of Turkey, and the little-known kingdom of Bhutan, way up in the Himalayas. But first, we go over to our news desk and Paul Wells. Paul? Thanks, Mary. And first of all, some up-to-date news for potential visitors to Guatemala as there has been some confusion about who needs a visa and who needs a tourist card. Well, if you're travelling on a British or Irish passport, you'll have to shell out $10 for a visa, which is valid for a stay of up to 30 days, and must be obtained before travelling to Guatemala. Apparently, visa extensions are very difficult to obtain. Most other EEC nationals can obtain a tourist card on arrival at the border for just $1, valid for 30 days, extendable to 90, but this extension will cost you a further $5. 
At the moment, it's unclear if this applies to French nationals who may need a visa. Check at your local consulate before leaving for Guatemala. Switching to Asia now, Burma has announced that the tourist visa facility will not be available for the time being. Regular viewers of this program will no doubt remember that visas were also restricted to seven days in any case. But apparently, you won't even get your week in now. The reason given is the recent state of unrest within the country, particularly in and around the capital Rangoon, where visitors' safety cannot be guaranteed at present. Now, we have had reports from our correspondent in Thailand that the Burmese embassy in Bangkok is continuing to issue seven-day visas, despite the official announcement. But it would seem a risky business going there at the moment, even if you can get in. And finally, from me, news of a welcome price reduction for children under the age of five at most resorts on the Costa del Sol in the south of Spain. There'll be at least 25% off all year round, and as much as 70% off in the low season, depending on the resorts. And on that happy note, it's back to you, Mary. True or false? Two. You will hear part of a lecture on satellites. Look at questions one to seven and decide whether the statements are true or false. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now. Listen to the lecture. The first man-made satellite was put into space by the Russians on October the fourth, nineteen fifty-seven, called Sputnik One. It caused enormous interest around the world. Although American scientists had already made plans to put their own satellite into space at the same time, their first attempt failed. The first satellite, Explorer One, was eventually put up on. February the first, nineteen fifty-eight, the space race had started. Since those early days, the pace has quickened. Now we use satellites for a variety of purposes to improve the quality of our lives. For instance, satellites are used to help forecast the weather more accurately. Storms can be watched. Advance warnings of droughts and floods can be given, and pollution can be detected by satellites. Another way satellites can help is by allowing scientists to study the mineral and natural face of the planet. Deposits of minerals, oil, and natural gas can be found this way. The rate of destruction of forests and the use of land for agriculture can also be charted. Something which benefits us all is the communications revolution, and this would not have been possible without satellites. There are now sophisticated telecommunication systems, which enable you to phone direct all over the world. Color photographs can be sent immediately from one end of the world to the other. Television programs, such as the famous Live Aid pop concert, can be seen simultaneously round the world. This concert was seen by a worldwide audience of one and a half billion people. There's another use for satellites about which we naturally know much less: their use in military operations. Satellites are regularly used by countries who wish to spy on each other. In fact, this is considered one of the most important uses of satellites. Perhaps the best-known way of putting satellites into space is through the American Shuttle Service, which was first launched in 1981. This is manned. That is, men are put up into space with the rocket to launch the satellites. However, this is not considered necessary by some experts, and manned space flights suffered a serious setback when all seven astronauts were killed in the Challenger disaster of January 1986. Shortly after liftoff, the rocket exploded and totally destroyed the mission. After this disaster, an alternative system. Which did not put human life at risk seemed preferable. In direct competition is the European rocket launch system, the Ariane 
L3S. This system is unmanned. The first launch from the Ariane's base in French Guiana on the northeast coast of South America took place in 1979. The Ariane system is built by ten European countries together, who form the European Space Agency, the ESA. Both these systems, the American Shuttle and the European Ariane, are in active competition for the multi-billion-dollar business of putting satellites into space. True or false? Three. You will hear a college lecturer being interviewed about the subject of her new book. Look at questions one to seven. And decide if the statements are true or false. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the interview. Now we turn to Pat Maynard, senior lecturer in education at King's College London. To talk about her new book on coeducational schools, a mixed blessing, which is published today, Pat, your findings make fascinating reading. They seem to suggest that girls do not benefit from being educated in mixed-sex coeducational schools. Well, I think they do more than suggest that. It is very clear from my research that girls are at a disadvantage in mixed-sex schools. Can you give us some examples? Certainly, we found, for example, that the behaviour of boys in the classroom towards girls actively discourages girls from speaking. When a girl tries to speak, typically boys fold their arms, lean back in their chairs, and groan or pull faces. They look bored and even make comments like "Turn it off," or "Pull its plug out." Now. If you were treated to insulting behaviour like that, what do you think your reaction would be? It would take considerable courage to continue, and in fact, we found that most girls learn that keeping quiet rather than contributing to the lesson in any active way was the most sensible thing to do. Indeed, so you found that boys do most of the talking in the classroom. Yes, and not only do boys dominate the classroom verbally. But they do so physically as well. One girl, for example, told me that boys deliberately take up a lot of room. If a girl wants to get up and get something, she has to climb over boys' legs, blocking the aisles. Then we notice that boys will deliberately lean across a girl's desk to each other, putting their arms all over her work in the process. And then, even worse, if the girl protests. He will act with astonishment, as if he hadn't noticed that there was a girl sitting there. That seems extraordinary, Pat. But what evidence do you have? For example, we've got diagrams of classroom seating to show that boys dominate the teacher's line of vision and push girls to the edge of that vision. Another thing, we have many recordings of teachers telling girls to be quick when they are speaking. Because if they're not, then the boys will start to make a noise and disturb the class. It's easier for the teacher if she or he pays more attention to the boys, because it's the boys and not the girls who cause the trouble. Girls don't make a noise when boys are talking. But what about the argument that single-sex schools do not prepare girls and boys too, for that matter, for life? What goes on in mixed-sex schools is exactly what goes on in the outside world. Men, or in this case boys, dominate women. In this case, girls. This is what people call normal behaviour. It is precisely for this reason that I would argue that girls should go to single-sex schools where they will not be dominated by boys and where they will have a chance to develop their potential without interference. Let's take our most famous example, Margaret Thatcher. Where would she be now if she had gone to a mixed school? But she was fortunate. She went to a school where she had a chance to speak, to learn how to express herself.
to be listened to with respect and attention. So she was able to develop the confidence to go out into the world, a man's world, and to resist attacks from men. My research shows that this is what girls need. Well, on that very interesting point, we must say thank you, Pat Maynard. Her book, A Mixed Blessing, is published today. Price three pounds ninety-five. True or false? Four. You are going to listen to an article from a magazine. Look at questions one to nine and decide if the statements are true or false. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the talk. Man has always been curious, and since prehistoric times, he has looked for new lands to conquer. First, he explored his cave, then the land. Next, the sea, and eventually the air. Now, finally, man is exploring space, and dreams of leaving the earth have come true. This wish to leave the earth and reach other planets was first mentioned in the second century A.D., when a Greek, Lucian of Samos, wrote two fantasies about men who went to the moon. One used a pair of wings made by himself. While the other was carried there by a waterspout during a storm, the moon was the obvious destination in early literature, as it is the nearest planet to the Earth and has clearly visible markings which led to imaginative conjecture about life there. But after Lucian, for the next one thousand four hundred years, no other writings about travelling to the moon have survived. Man seemed content in his belief that the Earth was the most important planet in the center of the universe, and therefore there was no necessity to leave it. This view was reinforced by the Christian Church, and in 1543, Copernicus was condemned as heretical when he published his revolutionary theory that the sun was the center of the universe, and the Earth, the Moon, and other planets revolved about it. Although this theory was criticized, it started men thinking about the stars again. Not long afterwards, the first telescope was invented in Holland, and Galileo, the brilliant Italian astronomer, used one to explore the heavens and discover much new information about the planets. When his observations were published in 1610, the Church threatened to excommunicate him. So he retracted most of his statements, but man's imagination had been stirred by this new knowledge, and in 1634, Kepler, the German astronomer who had discovered how the planets moved round the sun, published a story about a journey to the moon. His hero was transported there by magic moon people who could fly through space. Included in the story was a detailed description of the moon's surface. Which Kepler had seen through his telescope. After Kepler's book, there were many more stories about space travel and voyages to the moon. Mostly, they were fantasies, but some contained attempts at discussion of space travel, describing physical conditions on the moon, and proposing ways in which man could possibly live there. Rockets were first suggested as spaceships by Cyrano de Bergerac. In two space adventures written in 1649 and 1652, he was also the first writer to send his space travellers to the sun as well as to the moon. But when these books were written over 300 years ago, no one seriously thought that it would be possible to travel in space. It was not until Jules Verne, the French novelist, wrote his famous story *From the Earth to the Moon* in 1865. That any attempt was made to apply known scientific principles to spacecraft, man had been experimenting with flying ever since 1783, the advent of the first hot air balloon. But although various gliders and airships were invented, 
It wasn't until 1903 that the first powered flight was made by the Wright brothers in a wooden biplane. By this time, H.G. Wells had already published his famous space stories, The Time Machine and The First Men on the Moon. So, once again, writers were leading the way. Wells's prophecy in the latter story wasn't to come true until 1969, when the two Americans, Armstrong and Aldrin, finally stepped out onto the moon's surface. Since then, rockets have landed on Venus and Mars, and with the launching of the space shuttle, it will not be long before men visit other planets. Then it will be interesting to see if Wells's other prophecy will come true and man will travel faster than light. Will he, in fact, build his own time machine and travel through time as well as space? Many modern science fiction writers have gone far beyond this speculation and have their heroes teleporting from spaceship to planet with the greatest ease, dematerializing and materializing again at will, and making loops with time to unite past and future without effort. How much of this will come true we can only guess, but one thing we can be sure of is that writers will continue to stimulate our imagination with marvellous adventures, spectacular prophecies and astounding ideas, some of which no doubt come true and change fiction to fact. True or False 5 Listen to the following conversation between two students. Look at questions 1 to 7 and decide if the statements are true or false. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, Listen to the conversation. Here's your coffee, John. Uh, thanks, Pauline. Now, shall we start thinking about this talk, then? Uh, let's see, it's on the 20th, isn't it? Yes, that's right. That gives us three weeks to plan it. Shall we start by thinking about what exactly we want to include? Yes, that's a good idea. Now, here's some paper to make some notes. Right. Now, the talk is about pollution in the inner city. We should include some information to show how polluted they are, shouldn't we? Yes, it would be interesting to have some figures to show, for example, how much car exhaust fumes pollute the air. We could possibly get them from the Department of the Environment, couldn't we? Yes. Then at least people would be aware just how serious this problem is. And then we could go on to point out where all this carbon monoxide comes from. Hmm. You mean, for instance, cars and lorries? Do we have any statistics about how much the number of cars in the inner city has grown? Yes, yes, that's no problem. I think car owners should see just how much it has increased. People like to use their own cars all the time, don't they? Yes, it's quite incredible, really, especially as the bus service here where we live is not bad. I mean, in other cities, the public transport system is terrible, but at least the city council has given grants to improve it here. Hmm, but I still wish people would use it more. Should we mention ways of cutting down on the number of private cars by introducing, for example, a park-and-ride scheme so shoppers can leave their cars outside the city centre and travel in by bus. Yes, we could save that until the end of the talk as a possible solution. And how about the problem of the lack of parks and green areas? There aren't many here, are there? No, that's a definite point to mention. OK, let's see. Cars, parks, how about cycle lanes? They've been very successful in other places in reducing the number of cars in the inner city. That may be asking for too much. We've been asked to write a leaflet about the subject too, so maybe we could include it in that instead. Yes, I suppose we can't ask for everything at once. 
But I really think we ought to say something about the lorries which are allowed to drive through the city centre. You mean to suggest an idea to reduce their numbers? That's not enough. We need the council to introduce a law to ban them altogether. I know the shopkeepers won't like it, but yes, it'll be difficult. But it's necessary to make people aware of how much they pollute the air. So let's make a note of that too. Banning lorries in the city centre. Yes, and shoppers will feel safer with no lorries there. It's definitely time we had more pedestrian precincts too. Should we include that? I'm not sure. I'd rather keep this talk simple. The council won't like it if we make too many demands, will they? No, they won't. Okay, well then, let's see. So far, we've got these ideas. Look at the number of. Day thirteen. Review one. You will hear part of a tutorial between two students and their tutor. The students are doing a research project on computer use. Listen to the conversation carefully and answer questions one through five. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and answer questions one through five. Doctor Barrett, Sammy, come in. Is Irene with you? Yes. Good. Sit down. Right. We're looking at how far you've got with your research project since we last met.、Uh, you decided to do a survey about computer facilities at the university, didn't you? That's right. We decided to investigate the university's open access to a computer when they need one. So we thought it would be a useful area to research. Good. It's not a topic anyone has looked at before, as far as I know.、Uh, so it's a good choice. So what background reading did you do? Well, we looked in the catalogs in the library, but we couldn't find much that was useful. It's such a specialized subject. Hardly anything seems to have been published about it. And as well as that, the technology is all changing so quickly. But the Open Access Center has an online questionnaire on computer use that it asks all the students to do at the end of their first year, and the supervisor gives us access to that data. So we used it as a starting point for our research. It wasn't exactly what we needed, but gave us an idea of what we wanted to find out in our survey. Then we designed our own questionnaire. And how did you use it? We approached students individually and went through our questionnaire with them on a one-to-one -one basis. So you actually asked them the questions? That's right. We made notes of the answers as we went along, and actually, we found we got a bit of extra information that way as well. About the underlying attitudes of the people we were interviewing, by observing the body language and things like that. How big was your sample? Well, altogether, we interviewed a random sample of sixty-five students, fifty-five percent male and forty-five percent female. And what about the locations and times of the survey? We went to the five open access computer centers at the university, and we got about equal amounts of data at each one. It took us three weeks. We did it during the week, in the day, and in the evenings. Not the weekends. No. So presumably, your respondents were mostly full-time students. Yes. Oh, you mean we should have collected some data at the weekends from the part-time students? We didn't think of that. Okay, it's just an example of how difficult it is to get a truly random sample. So, how far have you got with the analysis of results? Well, everyone agrees there was a problem, but we're more interested in what they think should be done about it. The most popular suggestion was for some sort of booking system. About seventy-seven percent of the students thought that would be best, but there were other suggestions.
For example, about 65% of people thought it would help if the opening hours were longer, like 24 hours a day. Review 2 Harry is talking to a salesperson about hiring a car. As you listen, answer questions 1 through 10. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 through 10. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 through 10. I'm on holiday and I'd like to hire a car to travel throughout Britain. That sounds great. I wish I were going. Where do you plan to visit? Well, I'm going to look at some top tourist spots, Stonehenge, the Welsh Valleys, and I'd like to get right up to the north of Scotland to see the highlands around Inverness. Maybe I'll even get some great pictures of the Loch Ness Monster. That's the reason I'm hiring a car. I mean, I love the freedom to go where I please and really make the most of my stay. I see. Well, you've come to the right place. Book your holiday through our agency, and you'll benefit from the help of expert consultants like me. We can offer you the best deals going. We use only the most respected international car hire companies. I'm sure we can find just the right car for you, and if you pre-book before you want to go, that'll guarantee that the most suitable car will be available. And we make what we call our price pledge, too. In the unlikely event that you find a lower price with another international car hire company for an identical car, we'll match it. That means we'll refund the difference between what you've paid us and the offer from the other company. Can't say fairer than that, can you? Anyway, could you tell me more about the cars and, obviously, the insurance? I'm going to be driving several thousand miles, and I need a vehicle that will go the distance and not break down. Don't worry, sir. You're in good hands with us. We're one of the UK's largest car rental companies with a track record of over 50 years' experience. Our standards of service are unrivaled. Our cars are on average six months old and are subject to regular safety checks and maintenance. Er, about the insurance. Our higher rates include full insurance for all collision damage. Mind you, the careful driver's got nothing to worry about. Statistics show that Britain has the safest roads in Europe. One of our customers been driving for 35 years without an accident. And that's not unusual these days in Britain. That's reassuring. So what do your higher rates cover? Are there any extras? There are no hidden extras with our company, unlike some which I could mention, but mustn't. Our rates are fully inclusive and give you unlimited mileage, plus insurance against theft and, as I said, collision damage. Also, there are no fees for amending or cancelling your booking, so you're free to decide what to do. What about picking up and dropping off the car? We have collection points at town centers throughout Britain and at all the airports, which are open during office hours. If you prefer, your car can be delivered to and collected from your accommodation. That sounds fine. I would like the car to be delivered, but I'll take it to the airport myself when I go back to China. Uh, I'd be interested to know about various models I could hire. We can offer five types of cars. If you wanted a hatchback, you could hire a five-door or a three-door. Both of them have power steering and airbags. The larger one also has air conditioning. You know, a hatchback is a car with a door at the back that lifts up. Yes. What are the alternatives? The first alternative is our four-door sedan. Or, if there are only two of you, you might like our two-door open-top convertible model. It looks like a sport car. The other two alternatives are a bit different. If you want to go on rough country roads or off-road, 
We have a very good four-wheel drive vehicle. We haven't decided how many people will be going yet. Some friends might want to come with us. So, finally, could you tell me the prices? All our rentals are calculated in three-day periods. The people carrier costs 180 pounds. The sedan, 135 pounds. The hatchback, 63 pounds. The small hatchback, 47 pounds. And the two-door convertible, 111 pounds. Excellent value, all of them, especially if several people share. My thoughts exactly. I'll be in touch with you in the next few days to let you know which model I'll take. That'll be a pleasure, sir. Please take a copy of our latest brochure with you. Review 3 You are going to hear a lecture about the world's energy. Listen carefully and write no more than three words to fill in the blank in the following summary. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the lecture. The world's energy comes from a number of different sources, which may be broadly classified into two categories. The first, which includes fossil fuels and minerals such as oil, coal, natural gas, uranium, etc., comprises sources of energy that are non-renewable. The second category, which includes the wind, the waves, the tides, the temperature of the oceans, and the sun, comprises sources that will continue to provide energy in virtually unlimited quantities as long as the earth and the sun exist. And yet, despite the fact that they are to all intents and purposes inexhaustible, the sources of this second category remain almost untapped. Most energy is produced today by burning hydrocarbon fuels drawn from the world's non-renewable reserves. The amount of these potential reserves, by which is generally meant the quantity that can be extracted by present or conceivable future techniques, is a matter of some controversy. This is understandable. If we consider the enormous difficulties involved in determining how much fuel nature has hidden in the earth, and how much of it is or will become accessible, and the fact that different countries use different methods of estimation. Proven recoverable reserves, i.e., those whose extraction is already an economically feasible proposition, are considerably smaller. The great difference between potential and proven recoverable reserves is explained by the fact nature has placed so much of this fossil fuel in remote parts of the globe, at depths and in quantities that makes its extraction unjustifiable at present in economic terms. Let us now compare proven recoverable reserves with estimated consumption. Between now and the year 2010, the quantity of energy required by the world will account for almost 10% of its proven recoverable fossil fuels. If no other source of energy is employed, 78% of these fuels will have been used up by the year 2050, while a hundred years later, according to the most moderate long-term forecast, there will be none left. Comparison of consumption with potential reserves produces a somewhat brighter picture. By the year 2010, the demand for energy will have used up only 3.6% of these reserves and by 2050, 26%. A century later, about half of these reserves will still remain. These comparisons clearly show that the world's stock of chemical fuels is quite sufficient to cover its energy requirements for at least another hundred years. There is thus no immediate danger of, as it were, emptying the coal bucket. On the other hand, these reserves of fuel are limited, and within the foreseeable future there could be none left. 
It is possible that our children's grandchildren might find themselves in a world drained dry of natural gas and oil. We should thus lose no time in thinking about ways and means of producing artificial oil or artificial gas, and above all, of producing energy in unlimited quantities from sources which in no way threaten the environment. Review 4 You are going to listen to an article from a magazine. Look at questions 1 to 6 and decide if the statements are true, false, or not mentioned. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen carefully. Dr. John Ray has windmills on the mind, but these are not fantasies for tilting at nor idle daydreams. As chief scientist at the Department of Energy, it is Ray's task to keep Britain switched onto alternative sources of electricity and fuel. From wave machines to sun powered cars, he is the one who must examine all the options, and windmills, Ray believes, are among the most promising. There is a drawback. Wind power is greedy for land. At Altamont Pass in California, nearly 7,000 windmills cover 23 square miles. Yet, when they're all working at peak production, total output is 1.2 gigawatts, only about the same as an ordinary power station. It was the dramatic rise in the price of oil during the early 1970s that inspired Britain's so-called renewable energy from natural environmental sources which never run out, including those such as wind and tide, unlike coal or oil. The programme researches and demonstrates new techniques to industry, persuading companies and institutions to take them up. The flow of oil from the North Sea has taken the urgent edge off finding renewable energy. Research into renewables has a budget of 14 million compared to the 200 million for nuclear power research. However, Ray reckons he would have difficulty spending a bigger sum sensibly at the moment. Most of the cash goes to the onshore wind, tidal and hot dry rocks projects. Ray claims Britain is an international leader in the latter, which gets its name from the hot rocks beneath the Earth's crust that are a source of its energy. Water is pumped down under pressure, passed through fractures in the hot rocks and pumped back up again. Estimates of the potential vary widely, but some say there may be enough hot rocks under Britain to power the country for nine years. The tidal option seems the source which nature intended Britain to pursue. In the Severn Estuary, we have one of the best sites in the world for tidal power, says Ray. The proposed 5.5 billion Severn barrier on its own could produce a peak of 7.2 gigawatts over one year, equivalent to almost 5% of Britain's energy consumption. But there are big problems. Tidal power comes in surges twice a day. Unfortunately, no battery is big enough to store the amount of power produced at a surge. This is the universal curse, says Ray. So instead, the barrier must be geared to supply a much lower level of power consistently. This reduces its capability to 1.1 gigawatts, the equivalent of just one conventional power station. Realistically, the total amount of energy we could expect to get from tidal power, even looking 20 years into the future, would be 8%, Ray says. Day 14 Practice Test 1 You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to
to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. In section 1, you will hear two people talking about life in British cities. First, you will have about 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 9. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 9. I've been living in London now for three years, and I still don't think I've got used to it. Life is, well, very impersonal here. People in the south of England are rather unfriendly compared with people in the north. I come from a rather small town in Lancashire called Ormskirk. It's close to both Liverpool and Manchester, so perhaps I'm just not the sort of person to live in a place like London. For one thing, I find it's very difficult to talk to people here about anything. They're all so indifferent. Perhaps it's because they get so tired just travelling to and from work. In Ormskirk, I had plenty of friends. Here in London... I have very few friends. In fact, I don't think I have any. Acquaintances, that's what they are. Acquaintances. I know a lot of people, but I haven't any friends. Perhaps it's my fault. Or perhaps it's just the place. I was born in a small village in the west of Ireland, near Cork. And personally, I couldn't wait to get out of it. I came here when I was 18. I actually stole the money to come here, although I have paid it back since. People say village life is so much better than life in a city like London. Half the people I know here in London say they would prefer to live in a village somewhere. But I think they have a very unrealistic idea of what life in a village is really like. In most villages, people gossip about each other all the time. They've nothing else to talk about. They've nothing else to do. It's impossible to keep anything private for long. Your life is everybody else's property. Now, I don't like to say anything very nice about the English, but I must admit they're more tolerant than the people back home. People in small villages who've lived there all their lives are very intolerant, you know. They think everybody should be the same as they are. Here in England, well, here in London at least, people really don't care what you do, what you wear or how you behave, as long as you don't actually disturb them. Now, I don't know if that's tolerance or indifference, and I don't really care, but I think I've made a lot of friends here. Well, many of them are Irish, like myself, but I have some English friends. It isn't difficult to make friends in a place like this, as long as you're prepared to make contacts, to talk to people. It's no good just sitting in your room and waiting for people to come to you. You've got to go out to them. And if you don't, it's not their fault you haven't any friends. It's yours. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers.
Now, turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a talk about choosing the right course of study in the UK. First, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 10 to 22. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 10 to 22. Good morning. This talk is about studying in the UK and choosing the course that is right for you. There's a huge amount of choice of study courses in the UK. Over 200,000 courses are available on every subject you could mention, and some you possibly couldn't. What I'm going to do is outline for you five factors you should take into account before you make your choice. That is the way to find which course will help you most to become the best that you can be. The first factor is time. Make sure you give yourself enough time to plan your decision. Rush decisions are usually bad ones and may be disappointing and expensive. Take enough time to get the information you need from colleges, universities and training institutions. They usually have websites which provide lots of information and they are happy to reply to questions by email. But you need time to find the websites, download the information, consider it and, very important, talk it over with friends and family. If you are going to study in the UK, you must be serious about your future career, so it's important to make the right decision. Take time to think about why you want to study in the UK and what you hope to achieve. Plan your career goals. Actually write them down. Here are some suggestions. 1. To start a career. 2. To build your CV. 3. To gain expertise. 4. To broaden your skills. Let me repeat them for you. They're important. 1. To start a career. 2. To build your CV. 3. To gain expertise. 4. To broaden your skills. Once you have defined your goals, you'll find it easier to narrow down your choices. Remember that you'll usually have to apply for a course between September and December and start the following autumn. Applications for medicine, dentistry, veterinary science and for any course at Oxford or Cambridge need to be in, that is, received by the university, by the 15th of October at the latest. The second factor is to get a wide range of information. Don't just go by your first ideas. They may be out of date or plain wrong. You should consult a good reference book, such as the Guide to UK Education. You can also get brochures called prospectuses from any UK institution. These provide a great deal of further information. Be sure to ask if you have questions that aren't answered in the literature. You should also consider ranking information. Higher education institutions in Britain must publish the scores they get from the government for their teaching, research and other factors such as spending on facilities and graduate recruitment rates. Of course, you shouldn't make your decision on rankings alone. Some top-ranked institutions may not be the best in your subject area, may not offer the sort of placement opportunities you're looking for, or the kind of student environment that would best suit you. Factor 3 is more personal. 
First, ask yourself if you are really interested in the course once you have found out exactly what it involves. Full-time demands sustained effort and strong motivation. Secondly, get to know what methods of study your course will require. Some of these may be unfamiliar. As well as traditional lectures and demonstrations, you may also have to take part in seminars, undertake practical exercises, attend individual tutorials and go on work placements and field trips. Be sure that you feel comfortable with the study methods of the course. Thirdly, find out how you will be assessed. It could be on coursework alone, exams, practical work, or a combination of these. The fourth factor you should consider is the place itself. What sort of environment would you like? Do you prefer the action and excitement of the big city, such as London and Manchester? Or would you like to settle down in a more peaceful place, where the student community might be smaller? Would you choose to live on a self-contained student campus, or be closer to a town centre? Check what sort of accommodation the institution has to offer, and whether it will provide it only for your first year or longer. Also, don't forget the social life. Perhaps you want to be close to some of Britain's famous theatres, concert halls, art galleries or museums. Or you may want to take part in certain kinds of sports or outdoor activities. Or simply be free to roam nearby countryside. Whatever sort of social life you're looking for, be sure to check that it's available before you sign on for a course. Finally, last but not least, money. Costs may vary between different courses. In addition to tuition fees, you should also check other costs such as books, equipment, accommodation and living costs. You may also be able to get a scholarship or other financial help. Scholarships are highly competitive, of course, but they do exist so find out if you are eligible for one. So follow this five-point plan for choosing your study course in the UK, and good luck! That is the end of Section 2. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear an interview about why conservation groups, such as Greenpeace, are interested in protecting whales. First, you will have 30 seconds to look at questions 23 to 31. Now, listen carefully and fill in the missing information in the summary below. We hear a lot these days about whales and the need to protect them. But when did this interest start? Because people have been hunting whales for centuries, haven't they? Yes, for at least a thousand years. And there were no problems until this century, really. What happened was that fishing technology became much more efficient, and the ships were much faster, so more and more whales were caught. In the 1960s, the main whaling countries were killing more than 60,000 whales a year, 
and I think everyone began to realize that something had to be done. When did the killing begin to slow down? It was quite a slow process, and it was the environmental groups like Greenpeace that really made things change. I mean, they set out to make people aware of the fact that whales were fast becoming extinct. But even now, we don't know if this interest has come too late. If you take the great blue whale, for example, which at 30 or 40 meters long is the biggest animal there has ever been, now there are perhaps about 2,000 or so left. In fact, they have been protected for quite a long time, but there is still no sign that their population is growing. Am I right in thinking that killing whales is against the law? Yes. In fact, there was an international agreement to stop killing whales, but there are three countries which still catch whales, and they are Iceland, Norway and Japan. In fact, under the international agreement, they're allowed to catch whales for scientific research, and they use this as an excuse to carry on as they did before. What do they use the whale for? In Japan, it's quite a popular kind of food, and it's very traditional. That is the end of section 3. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section 4. Section 4. In this section, you will hear an introductory lecture to a course on Southeast Asia. As you listen, answer questions 32 to 41. First, you will have 30 seconds to look at questions 32 to 41. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 32 to 41. My name is Paul Stange. I'm coordinator of this course. It's called Southeast Asian Traditions. I'm also the author of the study guide and the course reader, and you should have those in front of you. As well as these, you'll need two textbooks for the course. There's the one by Osborne, and there's another by Legg. I'll talk a bit more about the reading materials in a moment. Now, if you haven't got these materials, you can buy the textbooks at the university bookshop, and you can collect the study guide and the course reader from me on your way out of the lecture. The purpose of this lecture is simply orientation. What I'm going to do is introduce myself, talk you through the course, and give you some additional advice, apart from what's contained in the study guide, on dealing with the various assignments for the course. First of all, the materials. You'll find the two textbooks very clear, and they give a good basic coverage of the history of the region. Most of the reading materials in the reader are fairly easy going, but I have to warn you that two of them are quite difficult. These are the readings by Smale and Bender. And of these two, the one by Bender is perhaps the more challenging. But don't let that put you off, because understanding these two readings is important to help you develop a clearer understanding of the cultures. In other words, they'll help you acquire greater sensitivity to the differences between the various cultures in the region.
Now, the course itself. The course has multiple aims. It's primarily a history course, but it's not only a history course. It is, in most respects, a cultural history course focusing on Southeast Asia. Nevertheless, the course is, as you'll see from the materials, an introduction to the Southeast Asian Studies component of the Asian Studies program. In looking at the cultural history of Southeast Asia, there are two major influences to be considered: the Chinese and the Indian. It's important not to forget the extensive influence that these two countries have had in the region. China has been trading throughout the region since at least the sixth century, so many of its cultural and social traditions have influenced the countries in the area, and religious practices from India have helped form today's culture. So we'll be looking for the links and the connections between traditional patterns and today's developments in the region. I think you can now begin to see how these past influences might form a background for the present-day social practices, and in the same way, this course will form a basis or background for second and third-year courses, with their focus on the modern period, and in particular the economic and political situation of the region. So that's the outline of the course. I'd like to go on now to look at what you have to do. Your assignments and so on. That is the end of section four. You will have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. Day fifteen. Practice test two. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. In section one, you will hear a conversation between two people talking about insecticide. First, you will have thirty seconds to look at questions one to eleven. Now, listen carefully and answer questions one to eleven. Yes. Oh, good morning, madam. I'm from Pestaway Market Research. I'm doing consumer research in this area. I wonder if you'd mind telling me, do you use Pestaway in your home? Pestaway. Oh, the insecticide thing. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. What do you use it for, madam? Fleas, ants, cockroaches, woodworm. Oh, cockroaches! This is an old house, you see, and we often get cockroaches in the kitchen. I tried scrubbing and disinfecting, but it didn't seem to do much good. And then I heard a commercial about pestaway. So I thought I'd try that. Was that on TV? 
No, it was radio, one of those early morning shows. You heard it advertised on the radio, fine. And you say you use it in the kitchen. Do you use it anywhere else in the house? In the bathroom, say? Oh, no. We've never had any trouble anywhere else. We get the odd wasp in the summer sometimes, but I don't bother about them. It's the cockroaches I don't like. Nasty, creepy, crawly things. And you find pest away does the trick? Well, yes, it's quite good. It gets rid of most of them. How long have you been using it, madam? Oh, let's see. About two years now, I think. About two years. And how often do you find you have to spray? Oh, I give the kitchen a good spray round the skirtings and under the stove, you know, about every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Uh, where do you buy your pest away, madam? A supermarket? Chemist? Oh, no. I get it at the little shop at the end of this street. They stock practically everything. It means taking a bus if I want to go to the supermarket. Well, thank you very much, madam. Oh, could I have your name, please? Mrs Edgerton. Mary Edgerton. That's E-G-E-R-T-O-N. E-G-E-R-T-O-N. And the address? The address is 12 Holly, Peterford. 12 Peterford. And may I ask your age, madam? Oh, well, just put down I'm over 50. As you like, Mrs Egerton. And occupation? Housewife? Well, I used to be a telephonist before I married. I had a very good job at the post office, but what with a husband to look after and four children to bring up, it doesn't leave you much time, does it? Occupation, housewife. Well, thank you very much for your time, madam. You've been most helpful. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section two. Section two. In section two, you will hear the welcome speech of the principal of a language school in England to students who have just arrived for a summer course. Put a tick in the appropriate columns to indicate whether the following statements are true or false. First, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 12 to 20. Now, listen carefully to the speech and answer questions 12 to 20. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our school. We hope you enjoy your summer course here with us for the month of July, and I know some of you are going to stay here for two courses until the end of August. I hope this gives you plenty of time to explore the surrounding countryside and visit the many typical English country pubs we are lucky to have in this area. For those of you here for one course, come to us for advice on which are the best places to visit so you really benefit from your month's stay here. By us, I mean myself the 12 teachers that work here in the summer, and, of course, the office staff. 
At the end of the day, you will know who your class teacher is, so I won't introduce them all individually now. Well, before you go on your sightseeing tour of the area, I would just like to say a few things about the school. It has been open now for 20 years, and during that time, thousands of students have passed through our hands. I myself came here five years ago, but Mr. Franklin over there has been here since the beginning. So if any of you choose to do project work on um, the history of the school, he is the man to talk to. The school itself consists of 14 classrooms, a small study centre, and a recently installed computer room which has proved to be very popular. The teacher's room is on the first floor and is open to you at all times, as is my office, which is next to it. The building opens at nine o'clock in the morning, so you have to do your homework in the study centre before classes begin if you are out late the night before. It also stays open until six in the evening, so you are welcome to use any of the facilities after the classes finish at four o'clock. There is a rota whereby a teacher stays to help students with any problems. As well as your classes here, there is a wide range of social activities that you can participate in if you like. This involves such things as horse riding, swimming and visits to local pubs in the evening, and weekend swimming or weekend excursions to places of interest in and around this area. So, uh, if you fancy trying a spot of hill walking or visiting the local mines, keep your eye on the social activities notice board. Our social secretary is John here. Hello. And he will be coming around to your classrooms to let you know um, what exactly is on offer this month. It is our policy to make your stay here as enjoyable as possible. And because of this, we strongly believe in an active social programme for our students. Finally, on a more serious note, please remember that in the community you are representing the school. Over the years we have kept in close contact with many local groups and societies and some of our students have joined them for the period of their stay here with us. We would like to maintain this close relationship with local organisations so that our students can have the opportunity to see inside the life of a small community. So, keep this in mind when you are out and about, please. And the last thing is a note from John saying that the start of the course disco will be on Friday night at 8.30. OK? Uh, let me just say once more, welcome to the school and England. This is the end of section two. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a parent discussing his son's school report with his tutor. Listen and fill in the missing information in the report below. First, you have 30 seconds to look through questions 21 to 31. Now, 
Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 31. Good evening, Mr. Jameson. Please sit down. Uh, good evening. Uh, now, about my son Stephen's report. Yes, just a minute. Yes, now, what class is he in? Oh, yes, 4E. No, 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 4A, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Has he improved this year, Mrs. Hargreaves? Yes, I think overall, yes. Mind you, there is still room for more improvement in some subjects. Let's see. Maths. Well, the major problem here seems to be his algebra. Apart from that, he's doing much better. Could you help him with this, Mr. Jameson? Well, to be honest, it wasn't really my best subject at school either. But the overall exam result was encouraging. 60%. Yes, and history... I seem to remember a bad report for this last year. Well, he lacks concentration in the class, and of course this makes it difficult to remember things like dates and names, and a memory is quite useful in a subject like this. Oh dear. Well, I'll have a word with him when I get home and see what we can do to improve that. And music. Music, yes. Is he still having guitar lessons? Yes, every Monday after school. His music teacher has commented that he doesn't seem to be taking them very seriously. I think it was just a craze he had, Mrs Hargreaves. I've noticed that he hasn't been very interested in practising at home. And also, he tends to talk a lot in class. I mean, he's very talkative. And he only got 40% in the exam. Well, nobody in our family is very musical, so I don't expect him to do very well. Looking at his geography result, though, there has been considerable improvement, 64%. Yes, I remember him working at home a lot for some sort of project or something on... Uh, now, where was it? India, I think. No, uh, on China. Yes, yes. And it was an excellent piece of work. I saw it myself and was very impressed. And his art classes have also been going better this year. Yes, he became very interested in pop art after the school and went to the local art gallery to see the pictures there. His bedroom wall is covered with posters from the shop. Yes, and 58% is not bad for his exam result, considering how low it was last year. And now French... It seems that he has really taken to speaking a foreign language. We hoped he would, because it's important to know another language these days, isn't it? Yes, quite. That's why we paid for him to go to France last Easter, so he could practice more. Well, it seems to have done the trick. 80% is a very good mark. Now, Mrs Hargreaves, I'd just like to ask you one more thing about... This is the end of section 3. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. In section 4 you will hear an extract from a talk about student health and specifically about ways to avoid headaches. As you listen to the talk, answer questions 32 to 41 by using words from the box to complete the summary. There are more words in the box than you need. Some words may be used more than once. First, you have 30 seconds to look through questions 32 to 41.
Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 32 to 41. Hello, welcome to the Student Orientation Programme. Today's session is on health issues, and this talk is about headaches and how to avoid them. It may surprise you to hear that headaches are often caused by hunger. In fact, one study suggested that 70% of headaches are related to hunger, which makes it the principal cause. The advice is simple. Eat three meals a day and try to keep to a fairly regular schedule of meals. People associate noise with headaches, and for most of us, excessive noise creates the conditions for a headache. Very loud noise is unpleasant, and people usually remove themselves from it. Having said that, younger people tend to tolerate noise better than their elders, so I may be leaving noisy places far earlier than you. Just remember that exposure to too much noise may predispose you to a headache. Of course, we all associate headaches with studying, in fact, the headache probably doesn't come from the studying so much as from being tense. When we study hard, we often hunch over our work. Try raising your shoulders and tensing them. Now relax. Can you feel how much more comfortable a relaxed stance is? Another thing, it's very important to check that you're working in good light. It will not actually hurt your eyes to work in bad light, but it will make you tired very quickly, and it's very likely to give you a headache. What's more, if you have the book flat on a desk in front of you, it will be harder to read, and you'll have to hold your head at an odd angle. It's wise to have a book rest, which raises the material you're reading at 45 degrees to the desk. This will help reduce your chance of a headache. Try to relax before bed so that you'll be relaxed when you try to sleep. A soak in a hot bath may be helpful. It's also important to really sleep when you go to bed. A good mattress is a wise investment for people who want to avoid headaches. This talk seems to keep coming back to tension. Tension may cause you to chew too forcefully clench your jaw or grind your teeth, and this in turn may lead to headaches. It's very easy to say that you shouldn't grind your teeth, but very hard to stop, particularly if you grind your teeth in your sleep. Try to avoid situations which will make you tense, particularly just before bed. If you do compulsively grind your teeth in your sleep, ask your dentist about a soft mouth guard in general, try to eat regular meals and avoid tense situations. Be sure you get plenty of exercise. Hopefully your headaches will be greatly reduced. One other thing I should point out, avoid smoky rooms and cars. Such places certainly encourage headaches, and the smoke may be doing you quite serious long-term damage. That is the end of Section 4. Now you have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test.